Good day. Um, we welcome you to the Bread Conference on the Economics of Africa. There's been a tremendous flourishing of research on the economics of Africa. And this conference was conceived of as a way of bringing together scholars who are generating that work and making it available to a larger audience. A major portion of this new research is being carried out by economists who have not previously been at bread conferences or have been closely tied to the bread network. So we've had a fabulous organizing committee that has made special efforts to spread the call for papers to a very broad range of economists. And the community responded with a flood of submissions. The committee has put together what I think is an excellent program with a variety of five, 20 and 50 minute presentations. I'd, I'd like to make an important note about the principle of allocation was um, how we allocated papers to these different uh, time periods. Papers were selected based on quality, originality and level of interest. The papers were then allocated to time slots based on the committee's judgment regarding the feasibility of getting the major point across in a given amount of time. So Robin Burgess from LSC and I, uh, Chris Udry uh, from Northwestern University are, are very pleased that you've been able to join us today. Um, and I'm gonna turn the program over to Robin to uh, thank uh, those who have helped us put this together and get us started, Robin. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm here in uh, London. Um, and luckily we get finished just before the football starts uh, uh, this evening. So I just wanted to say two things. One is that um, the kind of how we got here and, and, and it's an interesting story. So suddenly last March when COVID hit, Brad had to decide, are we gonna sort of wait to the, the pandemic passes and, and then return to in-person conference? And we decided very early not to do that and had indeed a, a conference at Northwestern with Chris and then subsequently another one at the LSE. And what was interesting is that we started to notice that we're getting bigger and bigger audiences, um, partly through streaming, but also just people registering for the webinars. And so Chris and I have for a number of years, I'd say two or three years, have been thinking of putting on a bread conference in Africa, actually physically located in Africa. And we realized that even better than that, or at least as a, a substitute, we could do something focused on Africa but virtually so you could all join from wherever you are in the world. And we, as Chris was saying, we were incredibly impressed by the, the set of submissions that came in uh, when we put out the call for papers. So I think in some ways the pandemic has taught us to uh, open up access to bread and to allow people to see the best development economics in the world. So I'm really grateful to all of you uh, for coming to this conference. I also wanted to thank people because the nature of Zoom conferences is that there's a lot of ebb and flow and um, you know, there's a lot of people who put an enormous amount of work into this, into this conference. So firstly, uh, Chris himself, who was with me, the sort of you know, the idea creator for starting this conference, but also Naba Ashraf at the LSE, Oriana Bandier at the LSE, also on the organizing committee, James Habri Ramana at Georgetown, Isaac Mabiti, who's with us right now, Amit Morjaria at Northwestern, and Julian Dungo, who's a, who heads up the ARC, Robert Darko Ose of the University of Ghana, uh, Tavneet Suri at MIT, Matteo Teachout uh, uh, at the IGC, uh, and Leonard Watchinkin, uh, who heads up the African School of Economics. So what we try to do is to sort of create a committee that represents you know, people whose interests are really centrally on uh, the economics of Africa. I also wanted to thank um, the, the, the the organizations that put this together. Um, obviously there's Bread, uh, where Lubala Chibwe, who's my assistant, has been incredibly helpful, but also very importantly, the um, AERC itself, the African School of Economics, uh, the, the, the Global Poverty Research Lab at Northwestern, and uh, mostly IGC who are in, in present behind the scenes here today. So there, I, I really wanna thank Laura Silly, who's been the main sort of force in organizing uh, the, um, the conference with Matteo Tichat, who's the research director at IGC, but also Tom Craster and Kunda Chibale Chima have been sort of working around the clock of the last uh, weeks, days and months to, um, uh, to, to get this running. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass this to Isaac and to Amit to sort of moderate, but let's move to the first presentation. And I'd also like to sort of say two final sort of housekeeping rules. One is a kind of, 
if you stay muted, but uh, so that we don't have background noise. But if you want to jump in and say things either on the chat or uh, directly, then please do so because the nature, the beauty of bread conferences, which we kind of the bit that we were, you know, that we all enjoyed before in person was was lots of interaction, lots of interjection. So we want to encourage that. We don't want people to feel that they can't ask questions either through the chat or directly. So please, if you have a question, ask it and we'll find, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to get that introduced into the discussion. But mainly on behalf of Chris and myself, I just wanted to welcome everybody uh, for being here and let's, uh, let's move on to the presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Robin and Chris. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome again to day one. Uh, we have a series of 20 minutes presentation today, moderated alternatively by Isaac and myself. Uh, presentations, uh, presenters have 20 minutes. Uh, registered panelists can intervene during the presentation and the wider audience can submit questions to the chat. Co-authors can of course respond live on the chat. Uh, and depending on the balance of time, we will draw questions from the chat. Um, so thank you again for being here. Our first speaker is Munshi. Munshi, welcome. Uh, you have 20 minutes and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, thanks, uh, Robin and Chris, for organizing this and inviting us to present. Um, so I'll get to it. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Good evening from Kampala. Uh, me and my colleague, Elijah, we, we live in Kampala, but this work is in Somalia, uh, who are also in the call, um, Catherine and Danila. Uh, they are the brain, the academics uh, behind this research, and uh, Elijah and me. Uh, we work, actually worked with Save the Children when we were implementing this, uh, this experiment with, uh, in the schools in Somalia. So uh, let me get to it. Um, so basically uh, the idea was uh, to, to look at the role models. Um, if we take children, uh, students uh, who come from similar backgrounds, but now attending colleges and go and talk to their younger brothers and sisters in the same communities that they may have come from and talk about their life experiences, how they have managed the obstacles and challenges uh, that they faced in, their, in pursuing their education. Does that influence uh, these primary students um, to, to aspire higher educational attainment? And uh, when we're thinking about uh, picking the role models, of course, uh, there is this difference of a male versus ro female role model. So we also wanted to see whether this exposure to male versus female role model influences the gender attitude of these uh, primary students um, towards uh, work or, or educational attainment. Just to say, uh, there has been quite a few research on uh, role model by now. Uh, few of them are experimental as well. Um, so this is not sort of brand new uh, in, the, in the role model literature, but uh, I guess the novelty is probably Somalia because uh, at the time when we implemented this, um, uh, doing an RCT was kind of um, uh, out of norm. Um, so in our study, as I said, um, the basic, it, it's a very simple idea. Uh, we have these schools, uh, primary schools, if we bring in these role models, does that influence uh, their, their, uh, their students' um, uh, aspirations and attitude towards gender? And for outcomes, we actually have two measures. So uh, at six months, we look at the sort of short term and uh, we also have a longer term, kind of two years later, we went back to see um, how those sort of short term changes have persisted uh, over, over two years or not. Given that it's a very low touch intervention, it's kind of, uh, it might, it is quite possible that there, in the short term there are quite a few changes, but in the long term they don't persist. In terms of implementation, um, so we worked with, say, the children, uh, who is one of the major players in terms of humanitarian programmers, uh, humanitarian program and development uh, sort of agency in Somalia. Uh, so they had a sort of education project, so which is basically a supply side sort of um, intervention, uh, constructing schools, training school uh, teachers, providing materials, and uh, those sort of things. So that that project had 46 schools um, located in three different uh, regions, um, and we pair matched these 46 schools to randomly pick 23 for the intervention. 
And then for the role model, which is our intervention, we, we brought in male college students or female college students to come and talk to these uh, children for an hour. Um, but before they came to this um, uh, sort of storytelling of their life experiences, they were given a sort of short uh, brief on how, what they can talk about. There was a little bit of prep for them. Um, but the overall, the whole intervention was very low touch, soft intervention. Um, and th so there are two layers of randomization in this research. So we first picked the schools. Uh, so we have a treatment school and control school, but within treatment schools, we also randomized by um, uh, whether uh, the students get fo uh, fo exposed to a role, male role model or a female role model. So in every school, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this, but um, in every school we had the role models talk about an hour for two sessions and then um, the students in a grade in a, um, could listen to either a male role model or a female role model just to see um, uh, that has any differential effect. The intervention was done back in April 2018. Uh, that was um, kind of beginning of a term. Um, then we did a quick survey um, in, in October, November 2018, six months later. Um, it was again very low cost, low touch data collection as well. Um, it was through self reporting, uh, assisted by enumerators. Um, and we sort of wrapped up all data collection in a, in a school within a day, basically. But the second follow up we did uh, two years later, uh, that was for only the graduating class. So as I say, the, the short questionnaire, two page questionnaire, uh, and we focus primarily on the education aspiration and gender attitude, but we also had a few um, characteristics to check, sort of uh, things that we should expect to be balanced. Now, going back to the literature, I think um, uh, I'll skip over it uh, and we can come back to it if there's some more questions. But uh, as I said earlier, there are quite a few studies on uh, that uses role model as an intervention. So, but um, uh, there are sort of many variations in what sort of role models, how it is done. So Emma Riley, she used uh, the, the movie Queen of Cutway to see uh, the educational outcomes for kids in Uganda for entrepreneurial aspirations, Bernard um, and others in Ethiopia looked at use sort of similar uh, videos, but for uh, farmers, uh, Shatil, they used uh, educational entertainment in, in Tanzania. So there are quite a few studies that show that uh, there are positive effects uh, on aspiration of, of young children uh, if they get exposed to the role models. Um, similarly, there is also some evidence that shows that uh, uh, exposure to successful women can also change their attitude towards gender and sort of uh, it, they hold more uh, uh, equal gender attitude, sort of, you know, um, less discriminatory gender attitude. Briefly about the context of Somalia. Um, I mean, I guess we, we all know that this is one of the countries which has been sort of affected by um, civil conflict, uh, climate uh, related vulnerability, a um, lot of internally displaced people, so they've sort of protracted humanitarian context for decades. Um, and even, you know, uh, some of this data that uh, kind of shows that the lack of just simple descriptive information. So um, on literacy, the earliest data we could find was from 2011 that shows that only 48% were able to read and write. And you know, unfortunately that may have gone down if we see uh, some of the uh, new information uh, that hopefully uh, will come up. There is a new uh, DHS survey. Um, although the primary education has been mandatory since 1975, you know, uh, such, uh, such a context, uh, we understand that uh, uh, it's, it's not practical and actually only 30% are enrolled at primary level. In terms of gender inequality, it's one of the countries with the highest gender inequality based on human, human development indexes, gender development index, um, based on whatever information available there. 
but it's also prominent in uh, school enrollment rate. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, for, for exposure to role models, for female role models, they, you know, sometimes teachers can work as role models, but only 15%, 14% of the primary teachers are female. Uh, and 4% of secondary school teachers are female. So uh, many of the children never see a female teacher, let alone sort of consider them as role models. Um, so we worked with Save the Children to, to implement this. And uh, we also partnered with Ministry of Education to provide support and sort of uh, uh, to review our tools for uh, cultural acceptability, et cetera. Uh, on the design, uh, as I said, we used pairwise um, randomization given our very small sample size. But within um, in each school, in each, each school, we treated four grades. Uh, two of those grades got male role model, two female role model. We had a total of fifteen role models, nine female and five who were distributed uh, by region within the same um, um, region that they come from. So in all school, we uh, treated grade four and six, male or female, that was randomized. Uh, but just to show um, how the treatment was rolled out. So uh, out of the 23 treatment schools, four had only four grades. So the maximum grade was four. So all the kids uh, from P1 till primary four, they got uh, exposure to the role model for P5. We uh, followed P2, P2 to P5 for treatment. and. Uh, um, so forth. For, for schools that had the full primary curricula coverage up to P8, um, uh, they got treated in P2, 4, 6, and 8. So basically we have a treatment group, a control group, and you can kind of consider uh, though these grades that are not treated, uh, like P1, if the high grade is above P5, kind of as a spillover group. Um, but uh, very quickly, we, we didn't find much spillover effect, so we, we don't talk much about that. Um, I think I'll skip this for the sake of time, but it, it, just to give some more information about the uh, interve intervention that we rolled out. We can come back to this uh, if there are questions on this, but we also sort of try to explain it in our paper uh, and uh, sort of move to the findings. So this is the, the baseline characteristics, comparability. Um, as you can already see, um, uh, when we did the 2018 survey after the role model intervention was rolled out, we couldn't collect data from five of the 46 schools. So we ended up with 19 control and 22 treatment schools. Uh, so, uh, but between these two um, groups, we don't see any significant differences in terms of school characteristics or things that we expect to be balanced. But in terms of student characteristics, um, um, there is a bit of difference in terms of whether the students missed uh, schools due to poverty and whether they know any fem female uh, relative who went to college kind of uh, role model that they may have within their family. So we try to control for these two variables in our analysis. So this is our summary of the findings. So we take away the spillover group. Uh, it kind of shows a neat Different. So on the left side, it's the gender inequality, gender equality index. So we had uh, four. We have four questions: uh, whether they agree, disagree, and we sort of uh, use that to create an index and sort of standardize it. Um, so compared to control, those who ex got exposed to fe female role model, um, they have much higher uh, gender in gender equality attitude towards gen equal gender uh, attitude towards gender is more equal um, and male role model is kind of in the in between. So the sort of graph shows that you know, compared to control, male role model changes their, their attitude a little bit, but female role model changes even more. One interesting sort of artifact of, of, of our questionnaire is uh, we had these four questions, um, you know, uh, more encouragement in a family should be given to sons than daughters to go to college and they responded if they agree or disagree to that. We also actually had a fifth statement that we had to drop because uh, the kids were smarter than we were. Uh, the question asked uh, was um, the, the um, boys are as, uh, the girls are as smart as boys. So we thought if they said disagree, 
um, and if they disagree, then you know they 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 have equal. Um, um, sorry, uh, I said it wrong. Let me say it again. Uh, the statement was the boys are smarter than girls. So if they disagree, we thought the girls and boys are uh, equally smart. But um, later on, what we find out found out, you know, some thought you know girls could be smarter than boys. So we couldn't use that question. Um, but anyway, on the college aspiration, we don't see much changes. It's kind of flat um, uh, for boys and the sort of for girls. There's sort of some differences, but no clear pattern there. This is to show in the regression, um, basically, um, uh, this is the effect for um, of female role model on boys. So uh, getting exposed to female role model makes uh, a big change for boys uh, in their uh, gender attitude. Um, but male role model does very little. So it was not exactly how we hypothesized our, our prior was, we thought maybe female role model influence female more, but what we find is getting exposed to female role model helps boys to uh, conceptualize you know, how the, their gender, gender attitude should be and what female can do or cannot do. Um, in terms of the differential effect for of female role model on, uh, on female, uh, we don't see any differences. So female role model works for both um, male children and female children but male role model does very little. On college aspiration, we have some positive point estimates, but um, not significant in any specification. Uh, given our small sample size, we tried to use uh, randomized inference and just to see the range of the p-values. Uh, it's basically the same. For female role model, the positive effect, the p-value is well within the sort of, uh, range of below 10 or five. Uh, for both boys and girls, but for uh, aspiration to attend colleges, uh, there isn't any effect there. Male role model didn't do anything. So basically the conclusion is fem female role model is useful, male role model may not be. And kind of seeing the results uh, quite intuitive in the sense that they already are aware about male going to colleges and being able to achieve all of those. Now going to the long-term results. So the one difference is pre, uh, in the previous slide, we're looking at all grades. So we could combine all the, uh, the, all the results, but for the long-term results, we're looking at only grade six cohort uh, of 2018 and who were surveyed in uh, 2020 again. So we're looking at the change of the same cohort at two different points of time. So on the gender, in, gender equality index, uh, we see a pattern that is uh, similar to overall pattern that we saw for all children. Um, but when we go to 2020, that kind of persists as well. So if we just look at the graph, it's kind of neat uh, pattern that for boys, female role model made a big difference at, in the short term, in the long term, it also persisting. For girls, there was a uh, short term impact, but it, it kind of, it also seems like it's persisting there, but for college aspirations, um, it's kind of a little bit all over the place, although there seems to be some positive effects of female role model in the long term. One sort of contextual fact is when we did this uh, 2020 survey, it was right before their final exam or the ex exit exam. So going to the college, the aspiration about that or whatever they say to our question of, you know, how much can you achieve in terms of education, if, you have, if nothing can stop you, probably is more realistic because uh, they are about to get to that point. Munchi, on, uh, Munchi, you, yeah. you'd like to wrap up, uh, just have a minute. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'm on the sort of last slide of findings. Um, so uh, when we sort of look at these results uh, in our regression um, for gender attitude and college aspiration, um, in the short term, we see these positive effects, but in the long term, Annoyingly, although the point estimates are kind of similar, and pretty high, uh, these are not statistically significant. And it's basically, we, we have really high uh, intra-cluster correlation within school. So that's kind of uh, um, an interesting observation that uh, you know, somehow there is a convergence um, um, as, uh, within schools as they go from younger to the high, sort of lower to the higher grades. 
but uh, that's what it is. Uh, uh, the, 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 in the long term, we don't see any significant results, also the, although the point estimates are quite high. So this is my last slide, but uh, I guess I'll just leave it open because uh, it's just to say that it was a low cost intervention, but we do see um, good short term effects. Some of those persist in the long term, although we're kind of less confident about the long term effects. Great. Thank you, Munshi. And thanks to Catherine as well for managing the chat. Um, in the interest of time, we'll have to uh, move on to the next presentation. Um, so it's Abebe. Uh, would you like to share your slides? Yes, Amit. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the organizers, uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to present our paper on, let me just, threats of audit and tax model in Africa. Uh, um, basically, we are reporting um, results from a field experiment we conducted in Ethiopia. Um, my co-authors, Daniel Zerfu from IMF and Frey Waldeus are also here uh, from the Policy Institute. Um, and uh, um, just the structure of the presentation. Uh, Amit, you can also give me heads up uh, if I'm a bit delayed. Great. Um, so, so basically uh, the motivation uh, for this study, as everyone knows, uh, falls within the broad team of state uh, building state capacity and as we know uh, this is a, a very topical issue all over africa today uh, and it, it resonates well with the policy makers uh, so the main uh, i think results will inform hopefully uh, governments in terms of uh, understanding the uh, different strategies to mobilize taxes uh, for the purpose of development uh, and I will give a bit on the theoretical framework that informed uh, our uh, empirical work uh, and then conclude uh, on the policy implications. I, I think the motivation I have just said it. Um, and if you look at even data on Africa, the tax efforts uh, correlation with external debt is amazingly negative. Countries with little tax effort generally tend to accumulate a lot of external debt. And um, uh, research also have shown that the uh, path of uh, uh, tax mobilization and development evolve together. That means they feed into each other. Uh, poorer countries tend to collect little tax, but because of little tax, they are poor as well. So and disentangling and also resolving this uh, cycle becomes an important policy agenda. And for Ethiopia, like everyone, low income country, uh, the share of uh, revenue to GDP uh, hovers around 10%, much lower than even the sub-Saharan Africa average. And it, in fact, it's been declining a bit uh, over the last few years, despite the fact that the government has done a lot in terms of uh, uh, reforming the tax systems, tax administration, and also the communication with the potential taxpayers, uh, including reforming the tax code, etc. Uh, uh, tell me, Amit, if there is echo on my part, if it's okay for everyone. We can hear you well. We can hear you well. Yeah, thank you. So, 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 uh, Ethiopian tax authorities have been exploring uh, various ways, uh, and as we speak, uh, a lot of reform is underway uh, to improve uh, tax mobilization. Uh, but I think, as we all know, um, one of the um, within the uh, literature, um, the most dominant uh, narrative, at least from the point of view of academics, is that. Uh, voluntary tax payment is not something understood very clearly. Rather, uh, what happens is tax is paid oftentimes because it has to be. It's an obligation, it's a burden. So if 
businesses and citizens can afford not to pay taxes, they definitely uh, will not willingly pay taxes. This is a dominant narrative. Uh, that's why then there is a lot of penalty uh, imposed on tax avoidance uh, or uh, let's say tax evasion. Uh, and that's why also tax authorities work a lot in monitoring uh, the citizens in terms of their earnings and uh, tax obligations. But when it comes to the tax authorities, uh, increasingly they believe also voluntary tax uh, contributions are important, which is the social or what you call the, uh, the tax moral uh, could be a very important avenue that needs to be explored beyond the strategy of uh, uh, deterrence or coercion. Uh, so this is what this paper intends to explore, uh, which is uh, to look at both the social and private motives for paying taxes, uh, even in a low income country context. Um, some of the well-known research have shown uh, this may work for developed economies, uh, but probably not for low income countries uh, because of low trust in government institutions and also across the board, the uh, degree of discrimination uh, and uh, businesses that are favored uh, by tax authorities. So there is a, a great deal of perception that uh, voluntary tax uh, payment may not be an effective strategy to pursue. Uh, even data tends to show that uh, from Afrobarometer uh, that we have looked at for instance, uh, Africans when in 33 uh, countries, when they were asked um, whether citizens should pay taxes, uh, nearly 27% say no. And some correlations suggest uh, there is a, a degree of mistrust uh, on the part of government authorities, which uh, generally tends to discourage people from complying. So the research question here is, how serious is tax evasion anyway? Uh, despite all the effort governments are doing to understand it, do they really know the true magnitude of tax evasion? Can we reasonably estimate it? And then which instrument tends to promote compliance? Is it voluntary persuasion, which we call tax moral or uh, coercion or uh, uh, threats. Now, uh, I think when it comes to the theoretical work in this area, uh, we all know the slippery slope uh, model uh, that engages uh, the perception of taxpayers vis-a-vis -vis tax authorities, uh, which has a, a different dimension, which means uh, in countries where uh, there is a generally a great deal of trust between citizens and authorities, uh, then um, a voluntary or compliance tend to be much better. But in countries where the degree of trust seems to be low and also the government institutions are weak, then tax evasion tends to be uh, very pervasive. So what we have tried to do is put together these insights but most importantly, when it comes to the uh, voluntary tax, uh, the, uh, the theoretical models we, we, we have tried to uh, uh, merge is the idea of guilt in case, for instance, taxpayers generally evade taxes, do everything to avoid taxes, but still have some degree of psychic cost or stigma in a situation where um, such blunt and um, uh, tax, uh, tax evasion uh, generates. So, so what we've done uh, in this uh, uh, paper is uh, uh, merge the two, the coercive and persuasion uh, motives uh, for uh, tax compliance into one framework uh, where we have uh, assumed uh, any business entrepreneur maximizes unexpected utility, uh, facing a flat profit tax of, let's say, theta, uh, and then uh, a decision to report a certain level beta to the government uh, with a probability of detection of pi, et cetera. So I, I will not go into the theoretical framework, but you get a very nice uh, uh, 
a static uh, relationship uh, between uh, um, detection uh, and, and uh, avoidance uh, and tax moron and uh, correction, uh, all linked to uh, expected profit or utility maximization framework. Now the question is, how do we capture the perception in from data? Uh, whether the motive for uh, complying or uh, or evading tax has to do with uh, stronger threats or uh, voluntary uh, tax model, which we have hypothesized in our model. Uh, randomization helps uh, because. Uh, of the usual known confounding uh, uh, factors that we observe in uh, uh, observational data. Uh, but also the, uh, if you do innovation in terms of the uh, exposing the taxpayers uh, to a potential uh, uh, treatment, such as for instance, threat or preservation, uh, we could see variation in their response during their tax filing. So what we've done is uh, in Addis Ababa, we worked with the revenue authority uh, people. Uh, and uh, the idea was to uh, deliver uh, different messages uh, very carefully uh, constructed uh, to different taxpayers in the capital city uh, about 5,000 randomly selected. Uh, and one group uh, was expected to receive a message from the revenue authority duly signed and hand delivered uh, about imminent threat of audit. And another group uh, was, was to receive a very complimentary letter from the revenue authority uh, praising uh, their performance in terms of tax compliance and then the other group received just uh, no letter. Uh, so so uh, the details uh, are given in the paper. Uh, uh, as you know, Ethiopia uh, is one of uh, the countries in developing countries uh, that is undertaking a huge mega projects uh, to uh, finance, I mean, uh, for development purposes. So there are so many things to display for taxpayers, including, for instance, the Grand Renaissance Dam, which uh, most of you know, close to $1 billion was uh, basically raised from uh, citizens uh, and many other uh, successful uh, projects that were implemented in the country. Um, and, and also, uh, when you look at the tax code, uh, it is one of the most severe uh, in the world. And very few businesses even knew about the white paper uh, that would uh, indicate the penalty of uh, uh, evading taxes. So we attached those uh, and making it really resonate well, uh, both for persuasion and for trade, uh, and were delivered uh, at a very uh, uh, at a chosen time where uh, there would be no contamination through. Uh, information sharing. As you know, this is a digital age uh, and you receive a letter from uh, a, uh, a revenue authority, uh, it would be very easy for you to call uh, your other uh, businesses to say what's happening, etc. So uh, we have really timed it well uh, in terms of uh, all of this uh, uh, experiment. Now, uh, uh, I think I can respond to questions on the experiment design. Um, basically, uh, uh, we have used the infrastructure of the revenue authority uh, and uh, the managers, the branch managers uh, in each county in Addis Ababa, uh, and also uh, enumerators who were selected to hand deliver the letters. Um, so basically, uh, uh, once those letters were delivered, we collected the administrative data uh, from the revenue authority to see the responses uh, before and after. Uh, the experiment. Um, the baseline uh, uh, characteristics uh, meet uh, the balance that you usually find in any experimental design. Uh, we have reported it in the paper. Uh, and after, uh, of course, we have used also 
uh, various approaches to capture the relationship between the treatment and the impact, uh, including the intensive margin, extensive margin uh, for uh, those also who have reported zero profits, etc. So our focus uh, in this paper uh, was on uh, profit taxes uh, uh, filed. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the impact is quite uh, enormous uh, before and after uh, the treatment, the distribution of uh, uh, profit taxes declared uh, uh, is, is significant. Uh, and we've done uh, uh, the usual uh, oil less and uh, the difference in differences, uh, potentially exploiting the panel nature of the data itself. Um, and also uh, doing some controls, uh, we were able to uh, find that uh, threats uh, raise 78% uh, profit tax uh, uh, and uh, preservation 32%, but there was no statistically significant difference between the two. So basically the finding is that uh, both preservation and corrosion seem to work. Uh, however, uh, uh, a year later, uh, when uh, we also investigated the data, we could not find any difference between all the groups, the persuasion, the corrosion, or the threats, or the control groups. So basically, uh, this tells us that the experiment indeed has done uh, a significant shock uh, to the uh, treatment groups, uh, but it has uh, uh, disappeared a year later. Uh, we've also tried to look at uh, a bit of a robustness check on our results. Uh, quantum regression uh, suggests uh, significant impact is observed. Uh, in businesses that are at the bottom of the uh, distribution, uh, which is, uh, I think, intuitive. Uh, and for the median, actually, uh, it, it fits into the results is more or less closer to the oil less and the deeds that we reported earlier. Uh, the matching estimator basically uh, is another uh, robustness check we have uh, used to show uh, how uh, our uh, uh, experiment is done. Uh, and so still, as you can see, uh, both trade and uh, uh, tax moral or preservation seem to be uh, important in the case of uh, Ethiopia. Now, we discussed this uh, finding with our revenue authority people. You know, we just say to them, what do you make out of this? And of course, um, uh, they were uh, uh, actually impressed by the result because you know, the magnitude is large. Uh, so there is a really widespread tax evasion, which they had already also perceived to be the case in the country. But in the case of, for instance, the uh, persuasion, they were a little bit uh, trying to explain to us, probably this could also indicate what you call uh, being under the radar of the revenue authority, um, uh, uh, not being convinced really by the message, but it could be probably uh, because uh, now the recipient of those letters or messages felt that uh, they were under observation and therefore uh, they uh, complied. But I think uh, uh, in, in uh, in, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, uh, uh, our result shows that if countries do effort, I think this is a unique result because uh, many of the literature we looked at suggest in low income countries, the issue of tax moral, even in developed countries, the experiments uh, uh, have shown uh, quite marginal effects, uh, even for trade. Uh, so in our case, uh, to find such a large effect is uh, an interesting uh, finding and a good benchmark uh, for um, other experiments. At, at uh, yes. Um, we um, we have a minute, but there, there's a okay. question. There's a question from Robin. Uh, maybe you'd you'd want to kind of take that live and. Uh, Robin, would you like to jump in? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's a very simple question. Simply whether you recorded people's knowledge of the tax penalties, sorry, tax evasion penalties, because one interpretation is they were blissfully unaware of them. 
and then when they got the letter, whether it's persuasion or um, penalties, audit, that made them aware. And so then they reacted. And maybe after a year, they realized they weren't going to get enforced. And so then they went back to ignoring them. So I'm just wondering whether you have any information on how much people knew about the consequences of not paying taxes. Did you gather that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good question, Robin. Yes, um, uh, as, as I mentioned, the details uh, are not well known uh, by many businesses. I mean, they know uh, is it tax, the tax office is uh, uh, something you want to avoid. You don't want to trouble with them. But when it comes to details uh, in Ethiopia, for instance, for uh, as small evasion as 1,000 beer, which is approximately uh, I don't know, in, in, uh, in the current rate, uh, not more than uh, 20 or $30, you could face a maximum imprisonment of five years. Uh, in the, so so that, that really scared people. So you are right. Uh, uh, this is what we injected in the letter, attached the, um, uh, the newspaper, uh, which carried the proclamation. And it made a lot of people aware uh, actually, what you have just said. So, so, yes. Uh, uh, to conclude, I think uh, the policy implication, what we learn out of this uh, uh, exercise is really, uh, uh, even though um, uh, trades generally tend to work uh, to enforce uh, compliance, but uh, at least in the case of Ethiopia, this has also reached maximum uh, because of the capacity of the revenue authority itself and also the uh, widespread uh, evasion and low trust in government. So to reverse the trend, uh, I think uh, it's important uh, for the government uh, to continue uh, minimize the cost of uh, monitoring uh, taxpayers. One of it is third party information. Uh, Ethiopia now can uh, effectively utilize this because of the value add tax that the country has introduced and many uh, businesses are now required uh, to provide uh, state recognized receipts for any expenses. Therefore, it's uh, easy for the government to do triangulation. Uh, but most importantly, I think, is building trust, being transparent, uh, and also continuously uh, campaign uh, on uh, what the government is doing in terms of public services, uh, even though some people still say uh, in the African context, uh, probably you may need to do more. Uh, thank you for your hearing. Uh, so I think I conclude my presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, there are a couple of questions on chat, which maybe you want to uh, address at some point, sure. but in the interest sure. of uh, giving everybody their well-deserved break, uh, we'll have a five minute break and try and get back on schedule shortly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Amir. Excellent.
Manisha, you almost ready? Hi, Isaac. I Hi. need to, um, yeah, I just wanted to, so I can't share anything until the we're on break goes away. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. okay. Um, and do you have co-authors? Your co-authors around? I do, so Jennifer said she's willing to answer questions in the chat box. Okay, great. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. We're speaking to the whole world <laughs> as, as, as we uh, converse now. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your uh, talk. Thank you. It's nice to see everyone, even though I'm seeing mostly uh, image uh, little uh, icons. So I think just uh, in terms of um, just to make things a little bit more interactive, if you could uh, at least put on your cameras, folks, so that uh, people can see that there's actually faces behind uh, those icons. Um, I know we've been uh, stuck on Zoom for a long time, so but uh, let's just keep trying for you know one more, couple more days. Um, so great, thanks, uh, Amit, for uh, moderating the first session expertly. Um, I'll try and uh, continue to uh, keep your, your, the high standards that you set. So we have two papers in this session. The first is by uh, Manisha Shah at UCLA and her colleagues, uh, Jennifer Seeger, uh, George Washington, Marcus Goldstein at World Bank and uh, Yao, Zhao Montalavo at the World Bank. I was trying to put my Portuguese spin on it, but I kind of failed on that. Um, so great, you have 20 minutes. Uh, Jennifer will be handling the Tech, the questions in the chat and the Q and A. Uh, if there's sort of like some questions that sort of come up, uh, I might take some liberties to just uh, interrupt you in there and uh, ask them myself. So please, twenty minutes. Great, thank you so much, Isaac, and thank you everyone for being here and for inviting us to be on this great program today. We're very excited to to share these results. As Isaac mentioned, my name is Manisha Shah. I'm at UCLA, and this is joint work with Jennifer Seeger, Marcus Goldstein, and Joao Montalva. All right, so. Being an adolescent anywhere in the world is a particularly uh, difficult phase of, of development, but in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, adolescents also face some of the highest rates of unintended teen pregnancy, uh, some of the highest rates of new HIV AIDS infections, and they're also facing high rates of, of intimate partner violence. And it's important to note that sexual relations, sexual relationships, as well as these sexual and reproductive health outcomes during adolescence and actually during adulthood involve power dynamics between males as well as females. And so what do we know? If we look at you know, the, the previous literature and economics on kind of what has been effective in shifting or improving sexual and reproductive health outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa, most of the previous work with adolescents has been very demand side related, meaning either education or information or cash. Um, if we look at the causal literature and economics on reducing violence, all of that has, has also involved either cash and or in-kind transfers. I think a few other important things to note here is a lot of the sort of family planning programs that we tout as having been very successful generally target adults. They're actually generally targeted at married adults, not even, you know, adults. And, and I think the other important thing I want to note here is that there's just been a historical lack of involvement of boys as well as young men in traditional sexual and reproductive health programming. And so what do we do in this study? Uh, we implement a randomized control trial with the idea of like, how do we shift these power dynamics around adolescent relationships with the ultimate goal of improving the sexual and reproductive health outcomes related to violence, unintended pregnancy uh, and disease transmission. And we're doing this in, in Tanzania. And so let me actually, show you what the design looks like. We're, we're working with BRAC in Tanzania in 150 of their ELA clubs throughout the country. And what we're going to do is we're going to layer on additional interventions to their ELA clubs. And I'll tell you about ELA in a minute. So at the, at the club level or at the cluster randomization level, we'll layer on a supply side uh, intervention, which is basically just a contraceptive drop that comes to these clubs. In addition, in about 50 of these communities, 
these or 50 of these clubs, we will also randomly, uh, you know, select these communities and intervene with the boyfriends of the girls in these communities. And we're going to provide them a soccer based health intervention that I'll also tell you about in a minute. So that's the club level randomization. And then on top of that, we'll layer on an individual level randomization where we'll invite girls in the ELA clubs to participate in, um, in a goal setting exercise. Okay, and so the, the thing to note here is that the control group here will be this, you know, arm one, which will be our ELA only girls. So the, the research questions we were most interested in, you know, one, does including males in these communities improve female sexual and reproductive health outcomes? And when I talk about SRH outcomes, the, the three outcomes we registered were unintended teen pregnancy, HIV, STI, as well as IPV. Um, and, and the answer to this question will be yes for intimate partner violence. So in these communities where we are you know, treating boyfriends, our girls will report decreased experience of intimate partner violence a year later. Uh, the next research question we were interested in is does you know, being invited to this goal setting activity improve female SRH outcomes? And again, the answer will be yes, but only for, for IPV. We, you know, part of the sort of supply side intervention was to be able to say something about the impacts of supply side versus demand side uh, for female SRH outcomes. This will very much not be a story about contraceptives because in the end, even though we're bringing free you know, modern contraceptives to the clubs, the take up is extremely low. And so I won't be saying too much about, um, about the supply side uh, intervention. And then also sort of, you know, lucky sort of the good news was at baseline, we tested all of these girls for STIs as well as HIV and um, prevalence was, you know, 1% or lower. So we're just underpowered to say anything about um, movements in, in, in disease prevalence. So this is Tanzania where we were working. Our clubs that we worked in were in Dodoma, Iringa, and Mbeya. And you know, there's about uh, 150 clubs and there's about 50 in each region. Average club size, think of it as you know, 20 to, to 21 members. Um, the intervention. So this is this is our control group. This is ELA only, and I won't spend too much time here because I'm sure many of you know about these clubs. These are, you know, the idea here is these are after school safe spaces for girls. Participation is voluntary, but once you agree to participate, you're expected to show up five days per week, three to six p.m. Um, you know, the, they target girls ages 11 to, to 22. And really the key component of ELA is very much this life skills, right? Learning about adolescence and menstruation, reproductive health, you know, what healthy relationships with boys look like? How do you build confidence? How do you stay away from abuse? And, and th there's been a lot of positive impacts from ELA coming out of Uganda. We were working in Tanzania where there was sort of less positive evidence. And in fact, you know, this was a collaboration with BRAC because I think they were interested in improving some of their programming in, in Tanzania. So what do we layer on? Treatment number one is a collaboration with Marie Stopes in Tanzania, where basically a nurse will visit these ELA clubs once every two months and just bring free contraceptives to the girls. If they want them, they can take them up. You know, they, Marie Stokes sort of business plan is around these long acting reversible uh, contraceptives, um, implants, injectables, IUDs, but of course they also brought condoms, uh, female condoms as, as well as the pill. And this is just a picture of one of the nurses coming to our clubs with, with all the supplies. Uh, treatment number two, so we also worked with grassroots soccer. Um, and they basically, you know, we, we gave them uh, the lists of boys to invite in our communities and, and grassroots soccer is very much similar to ELA, but it's for boys and it's very much like life skills training for, uh, for boys and the idea here is that boys get together on the soccer pitch and, um, and, and you know, while they're playing soccer, they're learning about risk behavior, uh, unprotected sex. This is just an exercise where they're kicking the, you know, they're on the pitch and they're kicking the soccer ball around cones and each cone is a risk behavior and, you know, you're not supposed to touch the cone. And so each lesson, e you know, each of these 10, 10 lessons has a key message. You know, in life, we should all stand up for girls and women to protect them from abuse. 
uh, you know, build your team with strong supporters that help you abstain from sex or to practice safe sexual behaviors like using condoms. All right, so that's that's our boys' intervention, um, and then on top of that, we layered on uh, individual level goal setting, where girls were invited to participate in a in a goal setting activity, and this seemed like um, something interesting to try out because so much about of goal setting is about self regulation strategies and and problems with self control, and so we thought this might be something interesting, you know, for for us to. To, to try out. And we, we very much follow the standard goal setting that's used in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and, you know, just to give you an idea that the goal here for the girls was to stay healthy and remain STI HIV negative. And the idea what they had to do, it was a 60 to 90 minute exercise where they had to write down zero to three strategies that they would need to engage in to achieve that goal and really think through a lot of the like behavioral issues that they might run into, um, you know, if, if they were having difficulties achieving that goal. All right, so those are, um, and just to give you an idea, these are some of the main strategies girls set, use condom, be faithful, abstinence. So, you know, lots of, lots of different interesting strategies. This is a two-year project. Yep. There's a question in the chat from Nava. Nava, do you want to ask your question? Just sure. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if uh, the, uh, you'll probably talk about mechanisms, so feel free to, to delete. I to will. Forward. But I, yeah, I just, um, because the pregnancy and HIV, you would expect to potentially have a very different mechanism when you have male involvement than the um, intimate partner violence. Yeah, but so now we disentangle that from a, from a statistical issue. Yeah, I will. I'll get to mechanisms in a minute. Okay. <laughs> and Thanks. you have about 10 minutes left. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So two year study, you know, we conducted our census and baseline, and then all the interventions start and then sort of, you know, eight months after the last uh, intervention, we go back and, and you know, retest and, and conduct end line data. So this is just to give you an idea of the summary statistics of the main outcomes that we were interested in, um, you know, and, and we collected, so in the regression soon, what I'm going to show you is we're going to generate indices for, um, for our intimate partner violence outcomes, but we did collect, you know, psychological, physical, and sexual abuse separately in the last year, as well as often. And, um, and remember, th this first column here is all of our girls ages 11 to 22. But what I think you'll find is interesting is when you just restrict the sample to girls who were already sexually active at baseline, you see, you know, we, we often hear that one in three uh, girls will experience intimate partner violence. And this is very much that one in three number, right? So girls who were already sexually active, about 27% of them have experienced some IPV in the last year. Um, high pregnancy rates, uh, as, as you know, you'll note here, but as I mentioned, our baseline testing revealed very low STI prevalence as well as a, a much lower HIV prevalence than we were sort of expected to believe given, you know, other data collection activities in that active, um, in that region. And you'll see here again at baseline, very few girls are using modern contraceptives like, at, like implants. That's not going to change. <laughs> we don't, we don't shift this at all. And, you know, and Navo happy to chat about this um, later about why we think we were unable to shift it, but we, we just weren't able to shift it. Um, we're balanced. Uh, and let me just leave it at that. So what we're going, what I'm going to show you now is we're I'm going to show you results from our balanced panel. And the reason I'm going to do that is to get selected to participate in the goal setting activity, you had to show up in our baseline data set. And I'm going to ask, I want to estimate models where we're estimating treatment effects for all of our treatments simultaneously. So I'm going to show you DD, um, ITT, uh, uh, figures in a second where I'll show you beta one, which will just be, you know, the, the ITT DD estimate of you being assigned to a community where boys were also getting treated. Beta two will be our supply side estimate, right? So this is you being assigned to these clubs where contraceptives were coming and beta two will never be interesting. So I'll just tell you that right now. And then beta three will be the average effect of being assigned to the, the goal setting arm. Okay. Um, so this is beta one here for this is for boys. So the basically what this is saying is, is that if you were assigned to a community where boys were receiving the grassroots soccer, you know, health based intervention, um, you will report a 0.16 decrease in IPV often 
and a 0.12 decrease in, um, in IPV in the last year. Okay, so this is the, the average effect for the, the boys treatment arm. This is the goal setting arm. So this is if you were assigned to goal setting and, um, and the impacts are very similar. 0.13 decrease in IPV often and about a 0.11 standard deviation decrease in, in IPV in the last year. This is just to show you this, you know, these are our beta two for the supply side. There's just, we get nothing. Um, you know, we were really expecting to see something here on pregnancy, um, nothing. Uh, this, this is just, you know, we do a lot of heterogeneity in the paper, but the kind of most interesting heterogeneity I want to flag to you is that girls who are already sexually active at baseline, this is what this is showing you is that for the girls who are already sexually active at baseline, the boys intervention um, actually decreases their IPV often by about 0.548. And so the big impacts on the sexually active um, and same for the goal setting, you'll see that the, you know, the, the impacts are just much bigger for the girls who are already sexually active at around 0.3 standard deviation decrease in, in IPV often. And so then what we do, you know, getting to, you know, we, we, this is sort of, I'm, that's the first half of the paper. In the second half of the paper now, we really want to think about like what sort of theory can explain these results, right? Where we have, including males in these communities is decreasing IPV, goal setting is decreasing IPV, and these results are just much larger for girls who were already sexually active at baseline. And so unfortunately, in the like, five minutes I have left, Isaac. <laughs> I won't have time to show you the model at all, but let me just show you some of the mechanisms and results that come out of the model that, um, that we develop, and then I can, I can end there. So with the soccer curriculum, there's sort of two potential channels there, right? So one is the soccer cur curriculum does explicitly talk about IPV, and you know the aim is actually to shape boys' attitudes around IPV. So that's kind of point one about the curriculum. And then point two is the soccer curriculum also teaches boys about just more general sexual and reproductive health, right? And so what we find around number one is in fact, if we, you know, we, we also collected some boys data in all of these communities. And we do find that attitudes around violence for these boys do improve by around 0.24 standard deviation. So they can't become less tolerant of kind of violence against girls. We also ask them about their own perpetration of violence and we don't find much there. But what we do find is this one question where we ask them like, hey, after you've had a few drinks, are you less likely to hurt your girlfriend? And here the impact is actually pretty big and boys do report like, yes, I'm much less likely to you know, engage in IPV after I've you know, had a few drinks. Um, the other thing, you know, in the in the model, another channel for IPV is through improved health, right? Because part of why you in our model, part of why you may engage in violence is this instrumental of like, I want risky sex, my girlfriend doesn't want it, I'm going to, you know, exhibit, I'm going to sort of be violent to be to extract risky sex from her. So this channel also plays out in, in that S, in that grassroots soccer is going to teach boys about sexual reproductive health. And in fact, we do find there's less sexual activity, both reported by boys as well as girls in terms of like fewer partnerships, less frequency of sex, less time spent with partners. We also find that boys have changing attitudes about condoms where they're now much more likely to say, hey, it's okay for my girlfriend to tell me I have to wear a condom. Um, at, you know, they're reporting this at, at end line. So that's the boys arm. In terms of goal setting, you know, the, the goal setting, there's nothing in the goal setting around violence. And so you might think it's a little like, why are they finding results are, on violence? The, the goal setting activity was all around strengthening the girl's commitment to like adopting safer sexual behaviors to remain healthy. And, and so in the model, there's sort of two potential things that could happen. You know, one is we're now increasing girl's utility from her own health. And so what you could see is a decrease in violence that way, because you're, you're basically increasing her indirect utility from violence to engage in risky sex. Because one of the reasons in our models, boys, boys you know, get risky sex is through violence, okay? Um, this could result in a backlash effect though, right? Because now you've changed girls' preferences for ris risky sex or their attitudes for risky sex. They no longer want it. Their boyfriends could get upset and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna increase violence to be able to extract, um, 
risky sex. We don't see any of that happening. What we in fact see happening in the, the goal setting arm you know, unlike the boys arm where we saw kind of less sexual activity and less partnerships, we don't see any of that in the goal setting arm. But what we do see is a lot more female churn. And what I mean by that is that in line, if you were a girl who was assigned to goal setting, you're much more likely to be paired with a higher quality boy. And when I say higher quality, that means a boy who's more likely to you know, use contraceptives, a boy who's younger, so we've kind of lowered that age gap between girls and boys, and a boy who's more likely to be enrolled in school. And so it does look like there's kind of churn and higher quality partnership at, at end line. And for the girls who actually stay in their relationships, in some of those we're noting, you know, these are small sample sizes now, but we're seeing that um, violence is actually going down in, in those relationships. All right. So Isaac have, has given uh, me the, Isaac. yeah, okay. <laughs> you need a, so I'm, yeah, a... I, I'm one minute. I'm done. So basically, you know, you might be wondering, are there any complementarities like for those girls who are both soccer as well as goal setting? We're not finding any of that. Happy to chat about that. You might be wondering about attrition. Um, we're okay on, on attrition. And so let me just sort of leave it with why we're excited about these results. Um, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of the previous literature on decreasing violence has focused on kind of cash and in-kind transfers. And, um, and our, what our study does is it provides two effective and relatively inexpensive and scalable interventions to reduce IPV. So, you know, we have some of the, the cost effectiveness results here where um, our, our interventions are just much, much cheaper um, than, you know, things like providing cash or, or in-kind transfers. And I think the other reason we're excited about these is that, you know, clearly changing these gender relationships or these gender relations and attitudes at this early stage of adulthood could potentially shift the trajectory of a lot of these young men and women um, and, you know, and sort of have positive impacts later down the road that we're obviously not able to capture in this study, but that we're excited about. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just one quick question that came up on the chat was about um, experimental demand effects. Um, could you just sort of speak to that real quick if there's if you're able to rule those out or how you dealt with those? So what, so what, what, what do you mean? Um, they were just saying like, I think the question was something about, you know, is the IPV, you know, some of the IPV results, are they just driven by like people saying, oh, you know, I know that they're asking my boyfriend right. about this. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. I just sort of yeah. I'm like, I'll say the right thing. And so you, yeah. a lot of it is, yeah. So just, is there, was there a way you, some clever thing yeah, you did so, to? So that's a great that, question. I mean, yeah. in fact, you know, part of, I like, for the goal setting, we never even talked about violence, right? It was never even sort of a, a part of the study. And so I, I don't think there would be any, so, so remember all of this is layered on top of ELA. And ELA does, you know, a, a part of their curriculum is sort of empowerment and, uh, and violence and et cetera. And so in some sense, there's no reason to think that like our, our treatments, um, you know, you, you would expect to see those things happening in our control group as well is what I'm saying, because most of that education is coming from ELA. It wasn't coming from like our goal setting activity. It didn't come from the contraceptives. And in the communities where like boys were being treated, yes, you know, we might expect that from boys, which is exactly why we might not be seeing anything on when we ask them about perpetrating violence, um, yeah. uh, but, but probably less from, from the girls. Thank you so much. Um, great, thank, that's really exciting work. Um, so now we move thank on you. to another exciting paper by Vesal Nurani and Abhijit Banerjee and Nava Ashraf. And uh, Nava, are you handling the q and A? I'll do yes, that. Yes, and I think, I think <laughs> Abhijit, Abhijit may also be here. Um, okay. And he has my, my link, I think, so. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so learning to teach and learning to, uh, by learning to learn, so it's... Uh, floor is yours. Great. Great. Thank you, Isaac. So yeah, um, so I've been in, in Uganda over the past two years, and I'm excited about starting a position with the uh, University of Chicago and the Development Innovation Lab that, that will keep me in Uganda uh, indefinitely moving forward. So uh, anybody who is in Uganda right now joining this conference, please, please be in touch. Um, so yeah, this paper is joined with Ava, uh, Nava and Abhiji. Um, Nava's online, um, and I think Abhijit as well. And uh, should also say that the paper is uh, 
labor of love together with um, our partner organization in Jinja, Uganda, Kimanya and Geo Foundation uh, for Science and Education, and also the District Education Office in, in Jinja. Um, but yeah, to motivate the paper just a little bit. So over the last few decades, we witnessed a large rise in student enrollment across the whole world. Uh, but unfortunately, this rise has not been accompanied by a similar rise in student learning. So in countries as diverse and spread out as Malawi, India, Ghana, Uganda, and Zambia, more than a majority of grade two students couldn't read a single word of short text when prompted. And a larger majority of students in India, Ghana, Uganda, Nicaragua, Iraq, Kenya, and so on, uh, could not perform basic two-digit uh, subtraction when prompted. And that's what you see in these graphs. Now, uh, the public discussion of this learning crisis is focused uh, primarily on teacher education. Uh, we see pedagogy that's based in rote learning of facts as a factor that limits learning in a lot of contexts around the world. And the available evidence that we have to date suggests that uh, general skills training for teachers or trainings that uh, improve the quality of teaching broadly uh, are unlikely to improve student outcomes. Instead, what we see evidence for is uh, approaches to structured pedagogy. In other words, uh, pedagogical approaches that provide teachers with a script or a recipe that they have to follow uh, to accomplish a, a, essentially a pre-specified learning objective or outcome. Now, um, these approaches might improve foundational skills like literacy and numeracy, but there's still reason to think that the teacher degrees of freedom may matter, especially when teaching 21st century skills like critical thinking, inquiry, scientific thinking, uh, ex exploration of one's environment and, and so on. So it's still a critical problem to think about how to address. So uh, broadly with this motivation in mind, the research question that we ask is, can teachers learn how to, how to teach? And very coarse answer that I'll unpack over the course of this presentation is yes. Uh, and we, we see one instance in which learning how to learn is a crucial component of the process of learning how to teach. We work with a partner organization in Uganda that trains teachers to be producers of knowledge. So what does this mean exactly? Uh, it means that the training takes them through this process where they learn how to pose sharp questions, use precise language to describe the world around them, frame specific hypotheses, and then use evidence and data from everyday life uh, to, to uh, develop these skills. And we evaluate this uh, approach to teacher training using a randomized control trial um, in Uganda, in Jinja district, where um, the results I'm gonna share with you today uh, are after two years where 40% of the teachers in treated schools have been trained. And our study focuses on grade six and seven, uh, but the treatment um, uh, is for the entire school. Uh, on average, the primary schools that we work with have around 13 or 14 teachers that are serving um, close to 500 to 600 students. So um, the research design, uh, for now, we have 14 matched pairs of schools, 14, uh, 14 in control, 14 in treated. Um, we have teachers that have gone through uh, two cohorts of teachers, each who have gone through one year of training, and each cohort has roughly 40 teachers uh, spread out across the 15 schools. Um, the baseline was collected in 2017. The first year of the training was in 2018. The second year of the training was in 2019 with a different cohort of teachers. And then we collected some uh, data in uh, the Sud County where we're working in, in November, 2019. Now, I should mention that we added additional schools uh, after that, uh, and our end line is scheduled, was scheduled for sometime in 2022, probably now in 2023. Um, and so the, the, the full paper um, will, be, uh, will be ready to share um, with everyone at that point. Um, just to give you a sense of the dramatic results that emerge out of this training, uh, we see an, an intent to treat effect of uh, 24 percentage points in the pass rate of this very high stakes primary leaving exam, which determines whether or not students can continue into secondary school. Uh, really gigantic outcome. Uh, uh, treatment effect and uh, equivalent to over 100 students being able to access secondary school just in this set of 29 schools that are in this site. But maybe even more interestingly, on the right-hand side, you see 
a graph that shows a, uh, the intent to treat effect of 0 0.61 uh, standard deviations in the aggregate score of the, of the PLE, which is in the top 90th percentiles of these types of education intervention uh, studies. But what I think is more interesting is also a qualitative difference between the distribution of scores in control schools and treated schools. Um, the control school distribution is consistent with a type of approach to pedagogy where teachers focus on the top performing students. And so you see this skewed, skewed distribution and a bunching of, of outcomes in the lower end of the distribution. Uh, whereas the treated school um, uh, outcomes reflect a more normal distribution and, and you can see improvements along the entire uh, range of the distribution, suggesting that the pedagogy is now reaching uh, more students in the classroom. So what's driving this type of result? So um, there's two components to the mechanism that uh, we think is driving the result and it's present in the training. Uh, first, the teachers are gaining firsthand experience of what it means to be a producer of knowledge. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it means that they can begin to value a new set of learning approaches. So for example, if one has always been subject to a hierarchical pedagogy or rote memorization, it's, it's unlikely that, they, that one would be able to value what it means to explore the world around them through a learning experience or to engage in conceptual learning in school or even to think, of, think critically through in the school setting about, um, about environments in day-to-day -day life. So on first, in the first um, experience, what, what happens in this training is that teachers, again, they gain firsthand experience of what it means to be a producer of knowledge. I'll get into an example in the next slide. But the second step is that after experiencing this approach to learning, the teachers then analyze what exactly was it about the learning environment that created that learning experience. So this allows them then to think about their own lesson plans and how they might design their plans differently to optimally, optimally match the pedagogy that, um, that they'd like to introduce in the classrooms with diverse learning uh, approaches or learning outcomes. So just to get, make it a little more concrete, um, I'll give you an example of the very first activity that teachers are subject to when they enter into the training space. So uh, teachers are asked by the, by the teacher trainers to make a shape out of clay. It can be any shape uh, that they'd like, but then they're given the opportunity to describe these objects to their fellow teachers uh, over the next 30 minutes. And so, you know, a conversation that ensues might be something like the following, where a teacher has created this object that's in the middle of the picture that you see and, and will say, this is a cube. And then the tutor will look at the cube and say, really, I see some dents in that shape. How would you explain this shape more precisely? And you can see even in this shape that I shared with you, the lines aren't exactly parallel. Maybe there's a few dents. You know, it's, it's not a cube according to the definition of a cube that we memorize in classrooms. Um, so eventually the conversation unfolds in a way that the teachers recognize that both their prior knowledge determines their ability uh, to describe new objects, but also that uh, simple shapes, they need to use simple shapes to describe new and increasingly complex shapes, and no particular shape can be described in a perfect way, according to the definition that the shape has um, in some abstract mathematical reality. So, um, so again, taking this example a little bit further and thinking about the second step of the training, which is the, the metacognitive analysis of the learning experience itself. How did the experience affect the thinking of the teacher? What elements of the pedagogy that they were exposed to are connected to thinking? So the teachers might reflect with the tutor and come to this understanding, again, focus on this example of the cube, that the approach that they just went through, this approach of questioning and, and trying to describe the nature of the shape that one has created, develops uh, one's power of expression. And it also develops a deep understanding even of the, what the concept of shape is. And the teachers will begin to realize that, in fact, uh, the tutor did not assume an answer for the teacher, but just continue to ask questions. And that this requires an orientation of humility and openness to data and refinement of ideas and so on. And so the teacher now, through this analysis of the pedagogy that their own trainer used, is able to think about the own, their own attitudes and their own approaches and how those might need to be changed in their own classroom setting. Again, because they've coupled the experience of learning in a new way with the analysis of the pedagogy that allowed them to learn a new way. 
Now, this example is not limited to cubes, it's, you know, and, and making shapes out of clay, but there's very, uh, the paper describes many re really, really creative and interesting examples of how scientific thinking is developed in teachers, how teachers develop a, a desire to explore the world around them, to, uh, to pose new questions and so on. And um, I'll, you know, I, there's not enough time really here to, to get into more of those details, but I'm happy to discuss if anyone is interested. But this, this yields a set of predictions. So again, thinking about what the baseline pedagogy is in this, in this environment, one in which teachers view themselves as depositors, depositing information into the receptacle of the student, as, as is a, made famous by this analogy by Paulo Ferreri. Um, the teacher pedagogy would transition away from that uh, because of the, the emphasis that's placed on that banking approach to pedagogy. So what we might predict, for example, is that students become more engaged in classrooms, they ask more questions, they spend time on concepts relevant to home life, uh, teachers become more sympathetic and they learn about students, learn from colleagues and so on. Um, now, all of these uh, results are, are all of these predictions, we, we derive measurements and, and we pre-specify these measurements and provide results in the paper. I'm not gonna have enough time to talk about changes in teacher pedagogy, what I'm going to focus on are, are um, and I should say that all of these results are, are, are show positive and significant effects, um, but what I'm going to focus on in this presentation are the uh, student learning outcomes, which are more downstream, uh, and I think are also a more convincing and policy relevant outcome to think about um, in the context of, of this conference and this paper. So um, we'll look at the changes in the standardized tests of students and also a unique and, and creative way in which we measure scientific competencies. We also have measures of critical thinking and creativity in the paper. Uh, future work is also gonna look at further downstream effects at the community level. So changes in parent attitudes, uh, use of practical knowledge at the home, all of which we have some promising qualitative evidence suggesting um, substantial changes at the household level in the way uh, education is experienced. So just to give you a sense of these tables, so we, we present to you the intent to treat effect um, using a pair of fixed effects. Remember, this is a, a pairwise matching design. Um, basically, what this means to the uninitiated is we're comparing the, the treated schools to the controlled schools. And um, we show that the treated schools have the average student in a treated school has a test score outcome in English that is 0.64 standard deviations larger than the average student in control schools, 0.56 standard deviations larger than um, uh, in, in science. Um, and these are uh, robust to multiple hypothesis testing and randomization inference, um, uh, among other things. Um, we also look at social studies results, which are 0.44 standard deviations larger in treated schools. And again, the pass rate, which I presented earlier, is 24 percentage points higher, uh, percentage points higher. We don't see a result yet in mathematics. Um, and this is in some ways a reflection of um, the, the fact that the, the training is in enhancing teachers' capacities, teachers' abilities uh, to, to teach in subjects where uh, the training focused on, on, um, on the content related to the focus of the training. So mathematics is a, a course that the, our partner organization um, is planning to introduce into the training um, in, in the future, but has not yet introduced uh, at, at the current stage or at the stage in which we analyze these data. So it suggests that we're, the results are not driven by, let's say, teacher enthusiasm or, or change in teacher motivation alone, but that there's some real capacity that's being introduced to the teachers to teach in a new way that's driving some of these results. There's about five minutes left. Thank you. Um, so, so then, but then when you look at these exams, um, you know, it, and you analyze the questions that they're asking, they're not exactly um, uh, the most, uh, they, don't, they don't engender the most confidence, let's say, in somebody's um, uh, understanding of whether a student has really enhanced a, a deep notion of learn in, in a deep, un, along a deep uh, dimension of learning. So for example, if you look at question one in the science exam, um, the question asks, give one reason why people keep poetry and the teacher is given, given a, a grading rubric and can only grade correct answers as being uh, 
poultry is, is, can be a source of eggs, a source of meat, or can be used for sale. Um, but certainly one might be able to analyze a community in a more intricate way and think about other reasons why people might keep poultry. So we wanna think about how can learning, how can student learning enhance beyond just the um, um, rote memorization of some of these facts or uh, providing these simple descriptions of, of why someone might keep poultry. So what we did is we worked with the district education office to organize science shows, which is a, an educational component that is promoted by the National Curriculum Development Center, but rarely used. Um, and, and what in the science shows, we asked all the schools in our study to um, organize their grade six students to experiment uh, with two different approaches to conserving resources in their communities, such as soil, minerals, fuel, water, and air, and also uh, some groups that would um, provide experiments where they prepare clean and safe water for drinking and washing. Then we measured outcomes across five categories when the students presented their science show experiments. So first, we, we looked at whether they were able to frame the problem uh, appropriately, whether the experimental design was clear and clean, um, whether, they were, um, whether they were able to articulate and test a clear hypothesis, uh, whether there are measured outcomes connected to those hypotheses, and also whether they were articulating independently when presented with challenges to those hypotheses. So not, not so dissimilar from an academic seminar environment. Um, we just quantify the, the learning results that emerge um, from that exercise. I'll give you an example of, of a, a question in category three. The students had a clearly articulated hypothesis. A judge would provide a score on the scale of one to 10. One being I had no idea what hypothesis the students were testing, and 10 being that the students mentioned a very clear hypothesis. Now, uh, again, we see large treatment effects with the science show outcome. Uh, we see uh, 0 0.87 points larger in the treated schools relative to the control schools. And again, I present a graph of the distribution of outcomes to the right. You can see that in general, uh, performance is quite bad, quite poor in a lot of these schools, but you see a fairly substantial shift to the right in the treated schools relative to the control schools. And if you dissect these outcomes a little bit, um, you actually see that the largest effects are coming in the more analytical um, uh, categories of, of measures associated with these scientific competencies. So the abilities of students to articulate clear hypotheses, link them to an experiment, uh, to observe and measure systematically the elements that are related to their hypothesis, and then to communicate their results independently. So that's all very promising. And one really interesting result that is in the paper, and I'm, I'm not able to flesh out in too much detail here, is that in fact, we can show that the science show outcomes are correlated with changes in treated school teachers' um, self-reports um, self of how inquisitive they are um, when, when presented with a question that they might not know the answer to by their students. In other words, we, do, we see a treatment effect that shows that teachers are more inquisitive in treated schools relative to control schools. Um, but we also show that this is positively correlated with outcomes in the science show, suggesting that teacher inquisitiveness is actually used in such a way as to improve the way in which students learn in treated schools, whereas similarly inquisitive teachers, or at least teachers that say that they're similarly inquisitive in control schools, don't know how to channel that inquisitiveness into higher performance in science shows, which I, which I find quite interesting. All right, uh, yeah, so we gotta wrap up. Yeah, okay, so I guess maybe if you wanna take one takeaway from this paper is that um, relative to the structured pedagogy literature, we show evidence for an approach to general skills teacher training that provides teachers more agency and flexibility and can allow uh, for movement away from rote learning, from fact-based learning, um, and especially uh, to, to train, to teach teachers, to teach students in a way where they can learn how to find uh, an answer to a question that maybe hasn't even been articulated, which is a key uh, skill in the 21st century, and really promising to show that there is an approach to general skills teacher training that, that can work quite effectively. Um, this, this slide uh, outlines next steps. Um, I guess I'm out of time now, but um, I'll just conclude by saying that our, our next steps will be to, again, increase the sample size. We're replicating the study in secondary schools. 
Um, and we're also working with the primary teacher colleges in Uganda to test alternative approaches to scaling up the teacher training. And again, um, looking forward to collecting outcomes at the community level to look at community level spillovers. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it looks like the teachers uh, really, really changed their behavior. I mean, what were some of the, just um, as we wrap up, I'm gonna take chairs and prerogative here. What, I mean, what were some of the things in terms, cause you didn't really get, you re didn't really get a chance to talk, tell us about the uh, teacher effects, but what are some of the sort of main drivers of sort of teacher behavior? What were things that really changed in terms of how they approached their pedagogy and their approach and their behavior? If you just give us like 30 seconds. Sure, yeah, so we observe classrooms. We find that teachers are, um, are more likely to, the students are more engaged in the classroom setting. There's more likelihood of seeing a question and answering approaches to pedagogy in the classroom setting. We also interviewed the students and asked them to tell us about their teachers and what their teachers do. And one really interesting thing that the students shared is that they feel more comfortable asking questions in class. Um, especially when they, you know, when they don't understand a concept. Um, and also we quiz the teachers on the knowledge that they have of their own students, which, um, and we find very large treatment effects there. So basically we ask them a set of questions that we could corroborate in the student surveys. And we find uh, treated school teachers are, I think, uh, 15 to 20% more likely to know in like details of the students' lives, such as prior school attendance and also who they live with, what the relationship is with, with their guardians and so on. That's, 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 that's very cool. Um, so thanks so much for sharing this very exciting uh, work with us. Uh, I think we are now on time, we're on break. We're a little bit behind schedule, but uh, I think uh, those are some, you know, we took a little bit of time to, you know, have a little bit more of a discussion. So I think that's fine. Um, I guess we're having a little bit of a break right now. Is that right, uh, our hosts? So I think maybe let's do five minutes uh, just so we can make up for some of the time. Is that all right? So we'll reconvene at, uh, uh, well, 12.45 Eastern time, roughly speaking. So five minutes. All right, thank you.
All right, uh, welcome again, everyone. Um, apologies for the short break, but we promise to give you a slightly longer break after the next session. Um, Tayamika will be presenting next. Hi, yeah. Hi, Tayamika. Will you be having your co authors yeah. join us, or is it just yourself? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, yes, I have. Um, Levison is here. Uh, he's joined us and my other co-authors will be joining in as well. Fantastic. Okay. All right. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tayamika and um, I'll be presenting on our work, which is titled Combining Financial Literacy Training and Text Message Reminders to influence mobile money use and financial behavior among um, village savings and loan association groups. This is from an experimental evidence from Malawi. So this is a joint work um, that I did with Marcus, Lucius, Levison, and Miriam. Um, Lucius, Levison, Miriam, and myself are from the University of Malawi, and Marcus is from University of Peru. And this was on a project that was funded by the Partnership for Economic Policy. Tamika, would you like to uh, put your screen on maybe full screen share mode? Um, sorry, I'm not able to see. Yeah, slideshow. Slide, yeah. yeah. It's on, I think, because I'm using. Oh. oh. I think this we lost. It's definitely one. worse. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, I was saying, has it started the slideshow or not? No, you. No. we lost your screen completely. My apologies about that. Um, I think because I'm using two different screens, so it's probably showing on my second screen. Yeah, you just have to make sure you share the correct screen. So if you do, yeah. yeah. Is that better? No, we, we don't see any screen at the moment. Yeah, there's, you're not screen sharing at all. Okay, sorry. It's okay, it's okay, it's all right, it happens. Yep. Is it Back showing now? now? Yes, yes, but it's, it's okay. just in PowerPoint, regular PowerPoint mode. If you uh, press F5. Oh, there we go. Got it up. Is, it, is it a slideshow now? Yeah, no, it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so apologies about that. Um, yes, so I was saying that um, myself, Miriam Levison and Lucius are from the University of Malawi and Marcus is from University of Peru. And this is a project that we had under the Partnership for Economic Policy. So as a matter of background, um, this study basically comes from the increasing recognition of the direct consequences of financial development and um, the influence on financial uh, inclusion and how these can help to alleviate poverty. So basically an inclusive financial system has the potential to economically empower individuals by offering them tools for better financial management. But from uh, data from the World Bank, from the Global Financial Index from 2017, we see that when it comes to low income countries, they're still struggling to expand access to formal financial services. So coming from 2011 um, up until 2017, we only had about 13% of the adult population that had a formal bank account in 2011, and that only grew to 24% in 2017. So the outlook is not really so great when it comes to uh, low income countries. However, we see that like lower mid middle income countries, income countries have started to close the gap um, in terms of banked population between them and the middle income countries and high income countries as expected um, have about 94% of um, adults who have a formal um, a bank account with a formal financial institution. 
But when we take into account um, new financial innovations um, that um, open up access to financial services through um, devices such as mobile phones or the internet, or indeed simple debit cards, we see that the picture now becomes very different when we look at low income countries, such as those um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, again, from um, data from the World Bank, from the Global Financial Index, we see that when we're comparing um, the past years from 2011 to 2017, we see a substantial growth in terms of the fraction of bank, adult, bank population, um, which is adults that have a formal bank account, or indeed when we include those that have mobile money accounts. So we see that here, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, the growth was from 23% in 2011 and has gone all the way up to 43% in 2017. Um, that's the same with growth, say, in Europe and Central Asia. So the gap still remains in terms of low-income countries and high-income countries, but the picture is definitely better when we consider um, other financial innovations such as mobile money. So why mobile money? So mobile money basically is uh, one of the most promising financial platforms that there is, which has helped to improve access uh, to financial services to the poor or those that were um, underserved. So as we've seen, this is basically in the least developing countries. And the reason is conventional banking systems by default were not designed with low income households in mind, so to speak. So most of the times we find that the cost structure, accessibility, complexity of the form of financial products make, makes it unsuitable and expensive for those who are not economically uh, or educationally equipped. While uh, platforms such as mobile money, these offer convenience, so they require less documentation from the users. Um, this is coming from, so this is suitable for people who are living, say, in the rural areas, who do not have identification or other documentation that would be required for them to open a formal bank account. Also, mobile money um, gains them access. So you would need just a mobile money agent, and all the mobile money agent needs to have is simply an umbrella and a chair and that's it, they've set up shop. While uh, this is compared to uh, a formal uh, financial institution, which would need brick and mortar for them to set up a branch near, um, near, near these people. So we find that mobile money agents are able to get closer to those that are in remote areas and those that are underserved. And then finally, it's the affordability. So mobile money services and platforms usually do not have things like book balances and they also have uh, lower fees when compared to formal financial institutions, which is um, one of the reasons why mobile money is becoming increasingly popular, especially among those that uh, were previously underserved by the formal financial sector. So our study is going to be drawing from four main strands of literature. And um, these are basically the ones that are looking at financial literacy training and uh, financial inclusion. So we've had studies by Dexla, um, who um, did a study, uh, an RCT in the Dominican Republic, and Sain Zoga, um, who also did a um, randomized control study in Rwanda. So these are um, literature that are looking at financial literacy training and then how this would help uh, migrant entrepreneurs. So in order for them to be able to solve complex financial uh, situations that they face. But also our study fits in with the general literature on mobile money. So um, Abiona and um, Martin Koppensteiner, for instance, um, look at Tanzania and um, how mobile money can help to ensure um, uh, families Against uh, Rainfall Shocks, which is also done by Emma Riley, um, but also we fit into the literature that looks at village savings and loan associations. So basically, these are small groupings um, that are reshaping the landscape of opportunities for financial inclusion in least developed countries. So they're basically transforming the financial sector and have positive impacts, um, have been found to have positive impacts on women and those who are historically excluded. And then finally, our study also fits into the literature that looks at reinforcements of training. Um, there's been a study by Abebe who looks at, uh, does almost 
something similar to what we're doing. Uh, they offer financial literacy training and also um, send out text message reminders. And they found that this was uh, more effective and had a greater impact than just the financial literacy training on its own. So what do we do then? We go a step further. And then in our study, we're basically asking the question of um, how can or can financial literacy training, but this time coupled with training on mobile money platforms as well, and then subsequently sending them text message reminders, can this have an effect on mobile money usage, mobile money knowledge, and financial behavior of village savings and loan association members? So to answer these questions, what we did was we partnered with the um, local non-government organization, which is called uh, Emmanuel International. So Emmanuel International basically overlooks or has projects uh, and um, overlooks the village savings and loan association groupings in two districts that we chose from them. So we implemented a randomized control trial in those two, two rural districts guided by Emmanuel International. And then we uh, offered them training. So we offered them training on financial literacy, which was facilitated by the central bank, the Reserve Bank of Malawi. And then we also offered them training on mobile money platforms, which was facilitated by the mobile network operators that offer mobile money service in Malawi, which are Airtel and TNM Malawi. And then, um, so our contribution then to the strands of literature that I just talked about before is we're stepping in to provide rigorous field-based evidence on exactly how and indeed if financial literacy training supported by text message reminders and mobile money training can influence mobile money transactions and related financial behavior on members of um, savings group in the short run because our study was um, a very brief one so it, it all happened in a, in a space of a few months. Okay, so um, in terms of the study context, so our study setting was done in Malawi and um, for the financial inclusion, um, formal financial account ownership in the rural areas, it's only 21% of adults in rural areas that own a formal, a formal bank account. Um, and this growth is very minimal compared to 2014, where 14% owned um, a formal bank account. And then also we have a general um, uh, differential gap where females, own, only 18% of females own a formal financial account compared to males who at least 29% of them own a formal bank account. And then when it comes to other financial services, again, we see that um, females are lagging behind from their male counterparts, even when it comes to mobile money accounts. And then um, as a government, the, 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 the government of Malawi has set up a financial sector development charter to try and boost um, digital payments in the country and also leverage these village, village savings and loan associations groups in order for them uh, to encourage them to use digital payments. Okay, so in terms of our uh, study, so our experimental design and sampling, we had a control group where um, there was no intervention, nothing was done. And then we had the treatment group and our treatment or intervention was basically a lump sum. So um, we combined financial literacy training and then combined that with mobile money training on the same group. And then later on sent them text message reminders about the training. So in terms of the timeline, we conducted a baseline survey, which um, was done in November of 2018. And then in December of the same year, 2018, we conducted the financial literacy and mobile money trainings. Um, and these were on the village savings and loan associations groups. And then starting from end of January, from 21st of January to 27th of March of 2019, we then sent um, our treated groups a text message reminders twice every every week about the trainings that we had given them on the financial literacy and the mobile money. 
And then basically these text message reminders, we had that um, we have those that had access to mobile phones. So these are the, uh, the, the group that we're expecting to have uh, read the text message reminders. And then those that didn't have any access to the phone, even though they were in our um, treated group, it means for the uh, text message reminders, they were excluded. And then for those that had access to mobile phone, we had those that had access to their own mobile phone, and then another group that had access to a mobile phone, which was not their own, but a relative's um, phone. And then in terms of our data, so we did balance tests um, on our data before in the baseline. And um, also both our treated and control groups um, were pretty much similar in all aspects, except from um, one occupation, uh, which was housework. So uh, individuals in our treated group were more likely, uh, we had more of them that worked as um, under housework occupations compared to our control group. But this, this and um, those that were divorced was the only, uh, were the only differences between our treated and control control groups, which made our, um, our two groups very comparable. And then um, when it comes to um, when it when it comes to the uh, financial usage, so uh, phone ownership, we see that only we found that only about 33% um, of individuals, both in the control and treated group, owned their own mobile phone. Um, of those that that uh, didn't own a mobile phone and had access to a relative's phone, um, almost 80% of them had access to a relative's phone. Very few of them actually owned or had a mobile money account. 17% in the control and only 15% in the treated group. And then um, we, we calculated indexes for knowledge of mobile money and usage of mobile money. Um, here, we're basically looking at whether they um, have used mobile money to send, receive, or save money, or to pay their bills, um, uh, or to send, yeah, or, or, or indeed to send money to someone, so as remittances. So this was um, as knowledge. So we created um, adding how many uh, of those they knew as under the mobile money knowledge index, how many of those features have actually used under the mobile money usage index. And then the financial inclusion index included um, uh, whether they had a formal bank account, whether they have saved with the microcredit facility, uh, whether they uh, have a mobile um, money account as well themselves and um, other features. And then in terms of our village savings and loan association, groups, almost none of them use mobile money platforms uh, for the transactions within their groups. So mainly these groups use cash and uh, do not use mobile money for any of their transactions. Okay, so in terms of our empirical strategy, uh, we estimated um, analysis of covariances. Uh, this was adopted from um, McKenzie. So we deviated from difference in differences due to our sample size um, because we only ended up with 554 um, uh, uh, participants uh, in the follow up survey. So we, we chose to go with the analysis of covariance. And then here are outcome variables. Where the indices. So the index for mobile money usage, the index for mobile money knowledge, and then the financial inclusion index. Um, yeah. So uh, now moving on to our results. So for our main results, here we're basically showing for the mobile money knowledge index, mobile money usage, and financial inclusion. And what we did here was to separate them to look at those that do not own a phone, those that um, have access to a phone through a relative, and then those that um, have access to their own phones. And what we found was that um, we found significant and positive um, impacts of the intervention, mainly strongest amongst those that that have access to their own phones. So for instance, when it comes to mobile money knowledge, we see that this went up by about 17%. 
for uh, those individuals that own their own phone. And when it came to usage, uh, it increased their usage by about 8%. Uh, it only increased the usage of um, those that had access to a mobile phone through a relative by 3%. And we didn't find any impact at all on mobile money usage on individuals that actually do not own a phone. And this was the same for financial inclusion. We, do not fi we didn't find um, any significant impact of the intervention on individuals who did not own a phone. Although for those that did own a phone, their own phone, this went up by 8%. Those that had access to a relative's phone, that went up by 5%. And then um, another, so we thought that one of our very interesting results was the, um, the finding, the result that we find for those that were treated but did not own a phone on their mobile money knowledge. So we actually get a negative impact because we're comparing um, the, these individuals who do not own phones to those individuals in our control group. So we see that, so basically our uh, findings point to the fact that um, financial literacy and mobile money trainings, as well as these reminders are good, but they're only effective if you indeed have a phone so to use it for the to access mobile money services and maybe indeed even the reminders then are more effective if you're able to see them on your own phone and like if those reminders are sent to someone else's phone or indeed if you do not get the reminders in the case where you do not own a phone and then we also um uh, uh, went on just to check heterogeneous effects. So here we included interaction terms between the intervention and um, whether or not uh, an individual had some level of education. So again, the findings are almost the same as the general findings in that um, uh, those that do not own a phone, even if they have some levels of education, they still um, have less knowledge compared to those in the control group who did not receive the intervention. And then again, the, the intervention was um, strongest amongst those with an education and who have access to their own phone, where mobile money knowledge was increased by 21%, their mobile money usage was increased by 8%, and um, their financial in inclusion, so whether they own a bank account, um, they have a savings with the, or a credit with the micro, uh, save, uh, micro credit level, and uh, that increased by 10% for those who had their own phones. And then we also looked at heterogeneous effects in terms of trust, so the individual's trust of mobile money. So here, uh, the measure of trust was basically, we asked the respondents a question on whether they agree or disagree with the statement that I trust a cash payment more than a digital payment using a cell phone. So this was our proxy for trust in mobile money, and this was was measured in on a scale of one to five, where one indicated strong agreement, and then five indicated strong disagreement. And we took um, four and five, uh, those that answered four and five, to then um, uh, give us an indicator that these were individuals that had a trust in mobile money. And then here again, what we find is um, trust in mobile money, the impact is strongest on those individuals that were treated and had their own phone rel uh, um, relative to those that had access to a phone using a relative's phone. And um, basically, yeah, that's the end. So what we had was just policy recommendations from there that um, we should encourage mobile money services, which are tailored specifically for these village savings and loan association type of groupings. And we should indeed introduce basic training on digital financial platforms that are easy to understand for the general public, because these have shown to have an impact in terms of um, their usage of uh, financial services that are available to them. All right, thank you. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Tamika, for sticking to time. Um, I think you have another minute. So if there are any questions, um, okay, I, I might take an opportunity to ask you one. In the VSLA group, um, are there entrepreneurs as well? Uh, or are they, uh, can you look at sort of entrepreneurial activity as another heterogeneity to see um, levels of uh, usage of the service? Yes, so we do have entrepreneurs. So actually, um, the two districts that we looked at, one of them is along the lake. 
and most of these that are along the lake um, um, take part in fishing. So we do have entrepreneurs in both of them, actually. So that's something that we should do, but which we didn't. Great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else have questions? Please feel to jump in. Great. Um, I know we're competing with dinner time or lunch time in different parts of the world. So uh, we will move to uh, Victor. Victor, uh, would you like to share your slides? Great. Is it working well? Yep, it's working very well. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and I'm gonna present a paper on mass media and modern contraception uptake in Burkina Faso, which is a joint work with Rachel Grenester and Joanna Murray. So the starting motivation for this paper is the fact that the geography of poverty is changing. According to the World Bank, uh, to the World Bank by 2030, 85% of people living in extreme poverty will be living in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is also the place where uh, we see the highest fertility rates in the world. Still in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, according to recent estimates, about a quarter of women in, of reproductive age report unmet needs for contraception. It means that these women would like to have fewer or stop uh, childbearing, uh, but are not using any contraceptive method. And it has huge consequences, first for their well-being, second for their health, but also for the health of their kids and also more broadly for other uh, economic impact and also uh, environmental impact. And so there is a strong need for cost-effective and scalable ways to help these women achieve the lower level of fertility that they currently desire. And so the question we try to address in this paper is the following, can mass media increase contraception uptake in Africa? And so there are uh, two parts in this question. The first one is the following. Should we expect the rise in access to mass media to increase contraception uptake? Uh, and indeed, there is, uh, we, we have evidence, there are uh, evidence, there is evidence that mass media has been associated with lower fertility and more liberal views in, uh, uh, in, in some contexts. But on the other hand, it has also been used for ill or to promote misinformation in some other context. So the answer to this question might, might depend on the content of mass media and also on the, on the context. The second question uh, uh, that is also very important is to what extent mass media uh, can be used to promote contraception. And this is potentially highly policy relevant because implemented large scale mass media campaign is relatively cheap and it can, uh, it, it is an easy way to reach uh, many people at the same time, even in remote uh, areas. And we also have uh, plenty of evidence that providing information can change behavior and in particular health behavior in a number of, uh, of contexts. But I think what we uh, lack a little bit uh, is to some extent evidence on the effect of mass media campaign implemented in real world condition, especially on subjects like family planning and contraception adoption, and uh, especially uh, in, uh, in Africa. So in this paper, uh, we, we uh, more precisely, we provide answer to two questions. What is the impact of increasing exposure to mass media on contraception uptake? Uh, and second, what is the impact of an intensive family planning radio campaign implemented in real world conditions? And so the context we study is the context of rural Burkina Faso, and we focus on community radios, which are uh, the uh, dominant uh, mass media in this context. And so the, the method we use, we use a two level randomized experiment. So on the first level, we use an individual level RCT in which we varied exposure to mass media. To do that, we randomly uh, we identified women who had no radio in their household and randomly selected some of these women to give them a radio. Uh, so we have exogenous variation in exposure to, uh, to the media. And second, we also varied the mass media content uh, by randomly assigning 
an intensive family planning campaign that lasted for two and a half years at the radio station level. So what we did is we took 16 non-overlapping local radio stations and randomly selected half of this radio station in which we broadcasted a, a, a two and a half years family planning campaign. And so to give you a preview of the results, what we find, first we find that giving radios in non-campaign areas, so in areas where we didn't change uh, mass media content, adds negative effect on contraception use and gender norms, which is consistent with these community radios uh, promoting conservative views in this context. And second, and in a sense, this is uh, more uh, reassuring and a more positive news, we find that a large impact of the family planning campaign on modern contraception, which increased uh, contraception uptake by 20% or six uh, percentage points relative to, uh, uh, to, to a control group. So in terms of uh, our contribution to the literature, so I'm not gonna uh, summarize the literature, but I'm just gonna uh, highlight the two key contributions of this paper in our view. So first, we think that to our knowledge, this is the first paper to simultaneously random, that sits simultaneously randomized access to mass media and mass media content. And second, uh, we also uh, think that this is among the very few papers that study the effect uh, that are able to identify the causal effect of mass media in real world condition uh, in Africa. So I'm going to uh, present, give you uh, some element of the context and jump into the design and result of this uh, uh, experiment and study. So on the context, uh, Burkina Faso, it's a, a poor country uh, uh, in West Africa where the fertility rate uh, is uh, six births per woman. So it's uh, relatively high. Uh, and in this context, radio are uh, the most prevalent uh, mass media and 70% of our sold in this context own uh, a, a radio. And in this, in the context of Burkina Faso, and but it is similar in, uh, in similar uh, in other countries in the region in particular, uh, most people don't listen to national radio station because these national radio stations are broadcasting in French. Instead, they are listening to community radio stations which are broadcasting in local languages. So on this map, what you see is the broadcasting areas of 16 community radio stations, which are part of this uh, study. And in terms of content, this radio station, they typically broadcast uh, a mix of information shows, sensitization program on health and education, but also debate and calling shows where people can express very different views and also religious uh, programs. So the radio campaign that we um, evaluate in this, in this study uh, was implemented by an NGO called Development Media International, which is an NGO that is specialized in this type of mass media campaign in low income countries. And they use what is called a saturation plus approach. So in a sense, it's like a very intensive uh, uh, family uh, planning campaign implemented during two and a half years in which what they did, they broadcasted every day, 10 radio spots of one and a half minutes per day and three phone in shows per week of two hours. Uh, and so this shows and spots were informed by extensive formative research and designed to tackle potential barriers to uh, contraception adoption. In particular, information on the modern methods, but also the health and economic benefits of birth spacing or gender norms or the responsibility of men. Overall, if you took uh, all this uh, information campaign, it represents 4%, 4% of total airtime uh, during these two uh, of these radios during these two and a half years. But if you uh, focus since um, uh, uh, spots and foreign shows were uh, mainly concentrated around peak listening time, here it represents 20% of peak listening time. So you have to think about this uh, family planning, uh, this radio campaign as changing significantly uh, the content of this community uh, radio. 
So what the design? So in terms of design, as I said, we have a two level random, two level of randomization. The first level is at the woman level. What we did is in each areas in blue, we identified with a baseline survey women we had, who had no access to radio in uh, in the household at baseline, and we randomly selected half of them and gave them a solar radio. So it gives us. Uh, exogenous variation in exposure to, uh, to uh, the media. So that's the first level of randomization. The second level uh, of randomization is at the radio station level. And so what we did here, you see that among the 16 radio stations, we randomly assigned half of this radio station to either broadcast the uh, intensive two and a half years family planning campaign or to continue business as usual and to broadcast the regular, uh, the regular program. Uh, so in terms of the timeline of, uh, of this intervention, so the radio campaign lasted between mid-2016 until the end of 2018. So it's a two and a half years intervention. And the radios were distributed in mid-2017. So for the radio distribution intervention, you have to think of a, a one and a half year uh, intervention. In terms of data, we collected, uh, we rely uh, on survey data and administrative data. So we collected baseline survey data on 7,500 women at baseline and at end line. So uh, I'm not going to show balancing test, but the characteristics are well balanced and attrition is uh, not correlated with the treatment. And we're going to also use a monthly, so high frequency clinic data on contraceptive distribution. Uh, for the universe of all clinics located in the study uh, areas. But for this presentation, I'm going to focus on the results from the survey uh, data, but the results are very consistent using both sources uh, of data. So just to give you an idea of the situ baseline situation, at baseline, 23% of women were using a contraceptive method, but about 46% of these women had unmet need for contraception, meaning that they were not using a contraceptive method, but they were they were uh, they reported that they uh, wanted to delay pregnancy or to stop uh, being pregnant. So our empirical strategy is uh, is quite straightforward. I'm going to show you just what the impact of the radio distribution and what the impact of being uh, assigned in an area where the radio campaign was broadcasted. Uh, and uh, um, by uh, each regression will be clustered at the radio station level. And we use wide bootstrap procedure to calculate p-values uh, to account for the small number of uh, clusters in the uh, cluster uh, R city. So what the results first on the first stage, uh, what's uh, the impact on radio listenership, uh, on radio listenership? What we find is that end line, 55% of women in, in our sample have access uh, to radio in their household, and they spend on average two hours listening to radio per week. And importantly, this is similar in a campaign and non-campaign areas. For the radio distribution intervention, so initially it was focusing on women with no radio at baseline, uh, we find an increase of on radio ownership from 32% to 66%. And the weekly time spent listening to the radio increased from 1.3 to three hours. And again, it is also similar in campaign and non-campaign areas. So now what are the results? So I'm gonna show you the results, the impact of this uh, different uh, uh, intervention on uh, modern contraception prevalence rate, MCPR, which is uh, the share of women using modern contraception, which is our primary pre-specified outcome. Mm -hmm. And so first we can look at the impact of radio distribution intervention, comparing women who did not receive a radio to women who did receive a radio in non-campaign areas. And what we find is a negative impact of distributing radio on contraception uptake. Second, we can look at the same thing, but in combined areas. And here we find something that is very different. We find a large and significant poly, uh, positive impact. And third, what we can do is look at what's the impact of the radio campaign by comparing areas, uh, campaign areas to non-campaign areas. And here we find consistent results with uh, com uh, the share of women using contraception being 35% uh, in campaign area and 29% in uh, non-campaign area. So uh, about a 6 percentage point uh, increase. 
Victor, so, there's, there's a question uh, which you might want to address. So the question is, how do we think about the income effect of the, the radio treatment? Who has property rights on, on the radio? So the, the radio were distributed to the women uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, in terms of income effect, this radio are uh, relatively, uh, they are worth about five US dollars. So it's not, um, the scope for a huge income effect is uh, relatively small, I think. And what we did is also we um, we implemented kind of um, uh, we gave a small incentive to these women to keep the uh, the radio for themselves during the the experiment in both control and uh, and treatment area. But that's a, a good point. But what we think is that the scope for an income effect is relatively uh, small, especially after one and a half year. Uh, yes, Isaac, did you want to also jump in? Oh, I just uh, I was just curious as you know, since you're paying for radio time, is there a sort of this is just more just curiosity, it's not that important, but are you do you see any effects on like the radio stations themselves? Like one, the treated radio stations are gonna be most uh, viable, the control ones maybe go out of business or something. Is that sort of part of the story that could sort of uh, I don't so, think it's gonna affect your results that much, but it was just something I was no, that's about. that's a very good point. We we don't have a lot of data on the radio themselves. We do have a lot of qualitative interview with radio, but since there is only 16 radio, there, is, there was no radio closure, for example, during the, the, the experiment. Uh, but and the content what, basically stayed the same, like relatively speaking, like in the control. So the, the, the content in the control, it seems that it's uh, according to, uh, for example, people working in this radio, it stayed the same during the, the experiment as it was before. But in, of course, in campaign area, it changed a lot because of the campaign yeah. itself. So now to give you uh, an idea on the uh, mechanism, uh, using uh, survey data, we can answer to some of uh, important questions to try to understand the mechanism. So the first one is why does exposure to local radio station have a negative impact in on campaign areas? And here, uh, what we find, uh, and I think this is a, an interesting finding, is that we also find that increasing exposure to radio station had also a negative impact on gender, norm, uh, gender norms in this context. And we interpret it as evidence that this type of uh, community radio that typically promote uh, conservative views. And this is also consistent with um, uh, qualitative evidence from uh, discussion and qualitative um, and semi-structured interviews with uh, people working in this, uh, in this radio. And one thing they, they reported in particular was that uh, one, effect, one potential effect of the campaign was also to, in a sense, train other staff at the radio level on uh, how to answer, for example, to questions from auditors on contraception and family planning. So that's potentially what explains why uh, we see this uh, negative effect in the control uh, in, in areas not targeted by the company. The second question, which I think is uh, information to understand the, the mechanism, which is interesting to understand the mechanism, is why did the information campaign uh, work? And here what we find, we find a large impact on contraceptive knowledge. And in particular, we find a large reduction on misinformation on the side effect of contraception. So women in uh, areas targeted by the campaign were about 10 percentage point less likely to think that uh, modern contraception can make a woman sterile, for example. We also find better attitudes toward contraception, but importantly, we find no impact on fertility preferences. So we change um, information and attitudes, but not uh, fertility preferences. Second, we can also look at heterogeneity and which uh, type of women were impacted by this uh, information campaign, who responds to new information, uh, to new information. And here we find larger impact among women who were using contraception at baseline, which also means that many women in this context are using it inconsistently, and larger impact among women with more knowledge and more positive views on family prior planning. So this is consistent with the program uh, chain. Uh, being more effective on those on the close to the margin of adoption. And finally, and importantly, we also find a significant impact on other key outcomes, such as a 10% reduction in fertility and a 30% increase on a, a standardized index of self-assessed uh, well-being. 
But for the effect on fertility, we are uh, underpowered, and this is only uh, marginally significant. So we are not uh, pushing that uh, uh, too much, but we are underpowered to look at this type of, uh, of outcome. So finally, a last thing we can, uh, we can do is to look at the cost effectiveness of this intervention. And so here, uh, the first thing to do is to look at the cost of implementing, so designing this uh, media campaign and also the cost of buying airtime at this radio station and, what, what the, and divide that by the impact of the program on contraception adoption. And so we can derive the annual cost per additional woman using contraception uh, during this pilot uh, phase. And, and this cost was about 50 US dollar per year per additional woman. But what's uh, uh, interesting, I think, with the, when we study mass media is that when mass media are scaled up and when the campaign is implemented at scale, and this is what happened following the uh, result from the pilot program, this, uh, this information campaign was scaled up uh, in Burkina on 38 community radio stations, so that you can see the coverage. It's covering about 80% of the population of Burkina. And here we estimate that the annual cost in case of this nationwide scale up per additional woman using contraception is only eight US uh, dollar. And so we can compare that to alternative approaches and we find that uh, this type of approach compared uh, favorably to uh, other studies uh, in the literature. And so to conclude, uh, I, I think that uh, we find two important results from this, uh, from this paper. The first one that in this context, uh, increasing exposure to community radio station without changing the content of this radio station had negative effect on contraception use and gender norms. But second, when uh, we uh, the content was a change with the, an intensive uh, family planning radio campaign. We found large impact of this campaign on modern contraception. And what's uh, important also uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, interpreting our result is that uh, it also means that information, especially on the side effect of contraception, is an important barrier in this context. Uh, we also find positive effect on self-declared well-being and the reduction in fertility. Infertility. Uh, we also find a larger effect on women closer to the adoption margin or those who are using contraception inconsistently. And finally, uh, we think that this is uh, potentially a very uh, cost effective uh, effect. And I'll stop here. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thanks, Victor, for sticking to time. Um, Catherine would like to ask a question, so we'll bring her in live. Hi, Victor, I'm Kate Casey from Stanford. I was just wondering, did you collect any data on males in households? And that kind of relates to like, would you see the same gender norm effects even with exposure to mass media um, and the family planning treatment? And kind of just thinking about the mechanisms, should we think about your experiment as kind of bringing women up to the information level of access that men have or treating the whole household with new forms of information? Well, I guess to... Be just to, there's a question that's very similar on the chat on the Q&A that also is asking about, you know, how do you think about the treatment? Is it everyone that's involved? Do you have information on who's listening to the radio? So just to piggyback with the question on the on the on the Q&A. So now that's a, a very important important point and in practice everyone was treated because like everyone listening to the radio uh, was potentially treated uh, by the uh, information campaign we were not able to survey men uh, directly but we have indirect uh, question relative to men in particular we asked the women what are the belief and uh, in particular what are the fertility preferences of their husband uh, and we find no impact on the campaign on uh, on that so this is imperfect because we are unable to uh, measure everything on the uh, in the side of men. But uh, the few information we have, uh, we don't find any effect on uh, men, in particular on their uh, on their bid. We also look at outcomes, for example, such as potential backlash on uh, intimate partner violence, this type of thing, and we find no effect. Uh, what we do find is the some effect on. Uh, marginally significant effect on uh, the number of um, uh, there are more uh, sexual relationships, for, for example. Quick, just one quick follow up. Like, do you have information on in the baseline of whether, you know, the household has any radio? So you could separate from households where the woman has no radio, but there the man has a radio versus the whole household has no radio. 
No, so that's a very good point. Uh, we do have information. Uh, so at baseline, we don't know exactly who on the radio. So that's potentially, uh, we know whether there is a radio in the household and we know the amount of time spent listening to the radio, but we don't know who specifically on the radio. We know that at end line, but of course this is endogenous in particular from um, intervention when we distributed radios because it was specifically targeted to, uh, to women. Uh, but um, otherwise, what we find, we find larger impact on households, uh, on women in household where they had a radio at baseline. Victor, relatedly, there was a question also on chat. Do you know who the um, women are listening with? Do, do you have any sense if they're listening with other, other adult women or children or neighbors or any, any further information uh, on that? So we, we, we don't have information on that, exactly on who they are listening to. What we know, for example, is, uh, for example, uh, whether they are discussing modern contraception or contraception or family planning with other people. And something that I think is also interesting, we find, for example, that uh, they are less likely in campaign area to discuss with other people in their household, so other women in their household than other people in their village. So there is kind of a substitution between the radio and discussing with other people in your, uh, in your household, which I think is, a, is an interesting uh, outcome. Great, Th thank you. Um, we'll, we'll have another break. Uh, we'll go for a five minute break. Uh, so please grab your coffee quickly. Thanks. Robin, sorry, we might encroach on the England game by five minutes. <laughs> Guys, this is worrying because um, there's the pre-analysis before the game. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a lot. That's yeah, that's the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, this is yeah. vital. Are you telling me the Jeffers aren't going to be as interesting as the kind of UK game is that is that what you're saying? Jenny, of course. <laughs> yeah, your competition, Jenny. Oh, we just we just want you to know what we're sacrificing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> should I have a should I have a copy of the television behind me so that I can compete <laughs> with it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you if you were here, Jenny, you could feel the energy in the UK. It's there's something crazy that's happened, and yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> No, of course, it's far more interesting to hear about um, environmental technologies among farmers, for sure. But <laughs> there's an energy at the here.
All right, I think we are ready to move on to our next set. Um, so thanks for this great set of papers so far. Um, next, we have uh, fertility, polygyny, and uh, experiment experimental evidence from Burkina Faso. So we're sticking with uh, the Burkina Faso uh, theme. Um, this is by Ben Dexel and Aurelia Lepin, Richard Bak. Bacchiono and Ludovic uh, Tapsoba. You guys. And Ben, do you have any co authors online? Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, I don't think I haven't seen anyone yet online. They might be joining okay. later. So okay, cool. uh, I'll get All right, just, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll sort of point out uh, anything in the Q&A that comes up that's particularly pressing. You have 20 minutes, so yeah, okay. please. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear and see me well, also the slides? We can see the slides. Um, the sound is a little bit choppy, but I hopefully maybe it's just me. OK. Um, OK, so uh, thanks, everyone. for uh, And also thanks to the participants for um, uh, accepting our paper. This is, uh, we've got a, a great program. Um, so as uh, Isaac mentioned, we're staying in Burkina Faso and we're um, making an extension. We're looking, we're trying to make a link with polygony, uh, which would, would actually, could actually been, have, a, have been a great follow-up question on a previous presentation, whether they found any heterogeneity uh, effects between monogamous and poly polygamous households. So this is joint work. I'm. Uh, based at the University of East Anglia. Aurelia Lepin is based at UCL. And then we have Richard Bacchione and Ludovic Tapsuba who are both based at Centre Muras uh, in Burkina Faso. This uh, research was funded by the ESRC. Um, and um, yeah, let's get started. So um, um, I, I probably shorten a bit the introduction uh, about Burkina Faso and also the trying to make a case in, in, in uh, about fertility. But um, yeah, let me say a few things. So we know that fertility remains high in sub-Saharan Africa, but we also know that contraceptives are, are now a lot more available than they used to be. And we see that this doesn't translate in a substantial decrease, uh, increase in, in the use of contraceptives. So this, this really points to a uh, a demand constraint. It's, it, it doesn't depend so much on the su supply because the supply has increased. Uh, it's more about how couples make decisions about the use of contraceptives. And there is, a, there is a, an interesting and, and growing literature on, in economics on, on fertility decisions in monogamous households. Uh, so I, I, I list a few references there. But there is very little evidence on polygamous households. Uh, we only found one paper published in a Review of Economic Studies by Paulino Rossi. Um, so, uh, but there is no, there is no experimental uh, evidence yet on, on, the, on the role of polygamy and, and, and fertility decisions. And this is a bit surprising because in Sub-Saharan Africa, 25% uh, of married women live in polygamous unions. And in West Africa, that's even 40%. So uh, we do know that outside the economics, there's a lot of interest in this topic. There's been a long discussion for, for at least two decades about the link between polygyny and fertility. And there are mainly two views. There is a view that argues that uh, polygyny uh, lowers fertility for women due to a substitution effect. So as the husband, has uh, multiple wives, um, he, um, he, he doesn't need that many children um, per, per co-wife to, to, uh, to satisfy his fertility preferences. So compared to monogamous households, uh, women might, might have uh, fewer children than um, in polygamous households. So there is a, a negative effect on fertility. And then there is an alternative view who says the opposite. He says that uh, polygamy might actually increase fertility per woman because there is a, a competition effect among co-wives. So the, the, the relationship in, in, among co-wives in, in polygamous households is, is, is of a dual character. They, they often have to collaborate, 
but at the same time they they often have to compete for the scarce household resources or, or the attention of the husband and there's some some very interesting literature on that so so to summarize there are the, these two effects go in the opposite direction and there is very little evidence this, that separates the competition and the substitution effects. This is, of course, an important question, because if we want to understand how monogamous and polygamous couples make fertility decisions, we need to, in some way or another, have an idea about the competition and substitution effects. And also for policy, policymakers need to know whether they have to differ, uh, uh, approach polygamous and monogamous couples differently? Should policy differ for these, for polygamous couples compared to monogamous couples? So these are important questions. And, and so that's why we, um, well, to, to, to answer these questions, we, we designed a, uh, an RCT in which we gave women a voucher that provides free access to contraceptives at local health centers in rural Burkina Faso. Um, so we, we work together with local health centers in uh, 30 rural villages. And so um, these vouchers um, were then, if, if used, were then um, um, kept by the nurses at these health centers. So we could then uh, know whether these vouchers were used or not. Uh, um, we then experimentally varied the influence of the husband by... Um, uh, using two treatments. In the first treatment, which we call the woman treatment, we gave the voucher in private to the woman. So we, we excluded the husband in the decision-making process. And in the second treatment, we gave the voucher to the husband with the wife being present. So, um, and we did that in a, in, a, in, a, in a sample of monogamous and another sample of polygamous women. So that's our data. And, and we use these two this data in two different ways. First, you can compare voucher use between the two treatments among monogamous and polygamous households to identify the effect of the husband's involvement in the decision and see whether that effect differs between pol monogamous and uh, polygamous couples. But you could also uh, do a comparison within each of the treatments. Um, between monogamous and polygamous households. And, and this might give us an indication of the competition and substitution effects. If we can assume that in monogamous couples, uh, I'm sorry, in the woman treatment, women have complete autonomy to make a decision, then we can compare, and, and we then compare voucher use between monogamous and polygamous couples, this would give us an indication of the competition effects. So how do the preferences of, of women differ between monogamous and polygamous households? How does that translate in a difference in, in the uptake of the voucher? Similarly, if we can assume that in the couple treatment, the husband has complete autonomy to make a decision about the voucher, then we, uh, and we compare voucher use between monogamous and polygamous households, we can get an idea of the size of these substitution effects. Um, uh, let me give you a, a quick summary of the main results before I get into, into the details. So the, the, in the first results, we, we found that in monogamous households, the husband's involvement decreases the use of the voucher, while in polygamous households, and especially in households where there is a co-wife rivalry or where there is no friendship among co-wives, there it actually increases the voucher use. So it has the opposite effect. If we then look at the competition and substitution effects, we find strong evidence in favor of a competition effect. In the woman treatment, voucher use is lower in polygamous households where there is co-wife rivalry, where, where co-wives aren't friends, than in monogamous households. And we, we find only weak evidence in support of a su substitution effect. So there is a, there is a difference uh, between polygamous households and monogamous households in the couple treatment but only un under certain conditions. And then uh, in the final part of the paper, we uh, critically look at two key assumptions that we're making where, when we're doing these analyses. First, um, we're assuming that there are no caring preferences. So you, the uh, utilities are not, not 
interdependent. So, so the husband do, don't care about the utility of the wife, and the wife doesn't care about the utility of the, of the husband, which just is, of course, uh, a, a bit unrealistic. So we look into that assumption, and we, and, and we do some further robustness tests. And the second assumption we're making is that in the woman treatment, the woman has complete autonomy. So she can uh, decide by herself without any interference by the husband. And also in the couple treatments, the husband has complete autonomy. So that's of course a key assumption when we're making these comparisons and we're doing some further tests in the second half of the paper. Um, let me now give you a few more details about the, the experiment. So here you see an example of the voucher that we use. Uh, you, you can see that it has a unique uh, ident uh, ID number that we use to, to do the randomization. So the, the randomization, the assignment to the two treatments is done at the individual level based on the last digit of the uh, ID of the voucher. It also mentions the name of the health center where the uh, participants can use this voucher. And it has a, an expiry date because we gave them one month to, to use the voucher. It's, it's then signed by the enumerator. Um, and of course, it also mentions the name of the participants that, that can use this voucher. A few details about Burkina Faso. Um, well, uh, apart from the fact that, it's, that it has a high fertility rate, um, it's important to mention that we focused on, and, and also that it has uh, very high rates of polygamy. 52% uh, of, of the women are in a polygamous household. Um, we, we focused on the on Western Burkina Faso, um, and we randomly selected um, 30 villages um, from which we then uh, recruited or invited nearly 3,000 couples. So we uh, interviewed all of them, and but we only continued with one third of them because we wanted to apply certain eligibility criteria. The, import, the most important one being that they were not using any contraceptives yet. And then we have two, two subsamples, a monogamous and a polygamous subsample. And the, uh, in each of these subsamples, we, uh, we, we randomized, we did the two treatments and we randomized them at the individual level. Um, there are several hypotheses that we wanted to test with this. The, um, the first hypothesis is that we, that in, um, in the monogamous couples, we expect the uptake of the voucher to be higher in the woman treatment than in the couple treatments, based on the assumption that uh, men have stronger fertility preferences uh, than, than women, certainly in monogamous couples. And so if we involve the husbands, that this will decrease the uptake of the voucher. This is uh, very much in line with the existing literature. So that's our base, uh, our, our first hypothesis. And we built on that by, uh, including the by adding these competition and substitution effects. So if there is a competition effect, then the, 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 this will change the 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 the, the, the preferences uh, of women. So uh, women in polygamous uh, union they will have a weaker preference for the voucher than women in monogamous couples. And similarly, men in polygamous couples will have a weaker fertility preference than men in monogamous couples. So we then summarize this in a, in a second hypothesis. And then a direct consequence of this uh, second hypothesis is that we, ex uh, is that we expect um, the difference in uptake of the voucher, the difference between the two treatments, to be smaller among polygamous households um, than among uh, monogamous households. Um, a, a few words about the empirical strategy. So um, of course, we, the, 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 the treatment was randomized, so, so we can use a, a very straightforward uh, regression equation. Uh, but then if we want to uh, bring in the uh, polygamous and the, the difference between polygamous and monogamous houses, it becomes a bit more complicated. We, we use an interaction term, um, but of course, we also need to control for differences between monogamous and, and po polygamous couples. Um, and we do that by adding a set of control variables, and we also add uh, village fixed effects. The, um, a few words about the, the different co coefficients. Um, 
so with this specification, we can test, we can identify a competition effect. We, 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 we would have a competition effect if beta two was negative, because this is uh, the effect, the difference between monogamous and polygonous couples in the woman treatment. And to identify the substitution effect, we need to look at the um, sum of the coefficients beta two and beta three, uh, because this measures the difference between uh, in, in the couple treatment between polygonous and monogamous households. So we expect that effect to be positive based on our hypothesis. Um, there is a, a, a few first regression results. So in the monogamous subsample, um, in the first model, we see a negative effect of the couple treatments. And, and this is very much in, in line with existing, with, with, with existing literature, uh, for example, the, the paper of, of Nava, Ashraf, Erika Field, and, and Jean Lee, they, they also found that in Zambia, that involving the husband decreases the uptake of, of contraceptives. Um, so that's very much in line with their findings. If we then use the polygonous households, we, we, we find a, a positive effect, which is not statistically significant. So we, we can't say anything about that. If we then use the pooled sample in models three and four, we find that the effect of the husband's involvement is statistically different between polygonous and monogamous households, also when we add controls in the Ford model. Um, so if we then look at the uh, competition effects, we, we should look at the coefficient of the uh, polygonous coefficient, so the second coefficient. This is negative, statistically significant, so this provides support for the competition effect. It, it tells us that uh, contracept the voucher use is smaller that it, it that voucher use in the woman treatment is smaller among polygonous couples than among monogamous couples so this supports the competition effect to test the substitution effect we look at the combination of of, of the uh, second and the third coefficient which is not uh, statistically different from zero so no support for the substitution effect now so far we 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 just uh, we, we didn't look at the relations among co-wives. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, the, the, the relationship among co-wives is, is of a dual character. They might be friends, they might not be friends. And uh, we, 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 it's crucial to, to distinguish these different type of polygonous uh, relationships. So um, our, we actually expect that the competition effect would, would probably be stronger among co-wives where there is no but there's more rivalry where they're actually not friends. And this is confirmed by the following regressions. If we uh, focus on the second model, where we use the subsample of polygonous households where co-wives are not friends, there we find a, a positive effect of the husband's involvement. So it's, it's, it's the opposite effect as compared to what we found with the monogamous couples. It's a quick question. Um, um, how, do you, how do you measure friendship here? Is it just like oh, self-reported or is we, it Yes, yes, it's self-reported. We we started with a with a baseline survey, so um, we just asked them. Uh, we had a list of all the co-wives, and then we asked them, "Do are you friends with them?" Um, so yes, so it's self-reported before the before the uh, before the start of the experiment. Okay, um, there's about two minutes left, so. Okay, so uh, that's fine. I can do that. <laughs> so what, what, is, what is probably most interesting is our models five and six. So here we've, um, we again, uh, if we focus on the, on the second coefficient, not friends. So this is uh, the effect of being in a polygonous household with co-wives who are in friends compared to uh, monogamous households, because this is the pooled sample. We find a strong negative effect on voucher use. So, um, but we don't find that that effect isn't that strong with polygonous households where they where they are friends, and um, um, so this 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 is in line with, with what we expect that the competition effect is mainly driven by polygonous households where where there is rivalry among co-wives. Uh, if we then also look at the competition effect, um, so the second part of the table, then we see a marginally significant effect. So the the husbands are more likely to, um, to use contraceptives in, in the couple treatments where there is a rivalry among co-wives. Um, and it becomes even stronger if we zoom in uh, 
to if we fo only focus on 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 the on the wives of the second rank. So here we have uh, polygonous households with wives of the first rank, second rank, and so on, and the effects are strongest where, uh, where if we focus on the wife who are second in rank and and and. To us, it's, it's not a surprise because we think that uh, the competition is strongest for for the wives with second rank. Uh, they have to compete uh, with the f wives of the first rank, and it's also in line with the anthropological literature that, that tells us that that um, there might be certain imp uh, power imbalances be uh, uh, between that that the wives of first rank they have actually have more power in the household than than the other wives. So um, yeah, I can I can stop here. Yeah, so yeah, um, you just wrap up in like ten seconds. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I can only say a few uh, things more about the robustness. So the the key assumptions about um, caring preferences between husband and, and wife, and the autonomy in these two different treatments. So we did some further robustness tests, um, and. Um, Yes, um, there are some differences in terms of caring preferences. So, so women tend to be less satisfied with their husband in polygamous households. But if we, we control for that, it doesn't change the results. So this is a uh, reassuring for, for our results. Okay, I, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, you have a I think, question or two in the Q&A, which I'll let you um, um, answer offline. Uh, well, not offline, like, um, as, as we proceed. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and I think we kind of have to move on to the next uh, paper um, by uh, Francis Anand at Georgia State um, on misconduct reputation under imperfect inf information. We can't hear you, Francis. And can you put your uh, slides on full screen, please? Okay, it's on full screen. Uh, uh, it's it's not. Okay, all right. I have to share my desktop then. Okay. There we go. This, okay, great. All right, thank you very much. So um, I like to start uh, by uh, thanking the conference organizers for, for including my paper, which uh, is gonna be on misconduct, reputation and, and information. Uh, just to get started, um, it, it turns out uh, misconduct, which uh, we're gonna think of as really market actions that are unethical and, and suggestive of fraud or wrongdoing is, is a really significant uh, phenomenon, you know, that lack really proper understanding, yet, you know, this is really prevalent in a lot of economic and financial transactions. Uh, so, so in theory, um, you might think that concerns for reputation by sellers, uh, in this case firms, should really deter, you know, misconduct activity and encourage the provision of quality services to, to consumers. However, in practice, it might be really difficult to establish or maintain even such reputational capital in a market environment with a lot of um, imperfect information. And why may this be the case? Well, imagine that consumers are poorly informed about, about transactional services. Then of course, this creates incentives for, for sellers to engage in, in this kind of misconduct. So um, I guess the, step, the main goal of this paper is to take a step back and ask two fundamentally related questions. One is to really get at whether misconduct really matters in markets. And if so, how? And the second is really to get at this uh, mechanism of really thinking about when and how does reputation really act as a discipline against seller or vendor misconduct. So I'll be using seller and vendors interchangeably. Uh, so um, to get at these questions, uh, what I do is to design a field experiment um, to you know, aim at measuring the impact of two-sided anti-misconduct information programs, which could take either of the following forms. So there's gonna be a program called Price Transparency. And the idea is to really give consumers the technology to be able to detect seller misconduct in markets. The second is what I call monitoring and reporting, which again, gives consumers the technology to be able to report misconduct uh, to authorities or provided. Obviously, um, the third program is gonna look at the interaction between these two programs. And as you can see, this is begging on looking at really uh, empowering consumers with technologies that can allow them regulate or enforce trustworthy behavior of, of sellers in these markets by turning on either you know, social sanctions or a direct punishment mechanism. So um, what I'm gonna do is to deploy these programs on the market for mobile money in Eastern Ghana. 
And uh, just a one sentence about mobile money. Well, so this is really an important, you know, economic, basically financial market innovation um, that is scaling rapidly in a lot of low income environments that have been shown to really improve welfare whilst, whilst decreasing poverty. So, and as I, you see, eventually, um, I'm going to argue that this is really an important market environment that really allows us to think about the interaction between misconduct, reputation, and, and information. And not only that, actually, it also allows us to really look at really an important problem that is really prevalent in, in many developing countries where payment services markets are really scaling. And obviously, so I'm going to be looking at um, Eastern Ghana, where I'm, I'll be looking at about 130 independent local markets, or which basically will correspond to localities across nine uh, different districts. So in terms of results, just in case you're unable to stay uh, to the end, um, what do we find? So at the first stage, I find remarkable decline in the incidence of seller misconduct in this market in response to the information program. And in fact, something I'm not going to show here is basically about really this gigantic spillover effects, even uh, across you know, vendors that are located in villages that were not treated, suggesting some possibility for, for you know, the fact that misconduct might be contagious uh, with a lot of externalities. Uh, why? Well, in the second stage, in response to this, we found really broader impact on both consumers and firms. And uh, what do I mean by this? For consumers, we saw really, you know, about 11 to almost 40% increase in um, the demand or take up of transactional services, mobile money services. Uh, including other non-mobile money services that I'll talk about, um, they were more likely to save on this, these markets. And together, because of you know, the usage of these services, obviously, and appealing to the old literature, we find really that households that are located in, in treated markets were able to mitigate shocks um, that were unexpected relative to those that were not by almost about 8% difference. Well, on the supply side, we find meaningful impacts on, on, on business sales revenue, which actually translates to about an elasticity of about one. Um, well, what explains this treatment effects? Um, the second part of the paper is really to think of a framework of moral hazard and sanctioning that allows us to show that the treatment effect is driven by two potential forces. One is that consumers, you know, became more accurate, more calibrated, and hold, basically hold, you know, nice below, really better beliefs about, you know, what the true level of misconduct is in this market, which obviously turns on, on vendor reputation. Uh, in the context. So one potential conclusion from this work here is that social sanctions through reputational impacts or effects could actually promote formal local markets in an environment where the formal institutions might appear weak. So let's, let's, let me tell you, so in the next couple of minutes, I will try to give you a snapshot of the paper by going through first the setting and the design, I present the results and obviously try to interpret them briefly. And if there's more time, I'll, I'll touch on the literature, but I certainly doubt if there will be more time for that. So what is mobile money? Uh, let's start with that. So for, for lack of a better you know, definition, I like to think of mobile money as a human version of ATMs. Well, um, this, this is typically, imagine a market structure, a vertical market structure, where you have service providers, which typically may be some commercial bank joint partnership with telecommunication companies that are upstream, and they basically deploy these you know, uh, vendors at the downstream, or sellers, if you want to call them broadly, uh, that offer these cash in or cash out services to consumers. And obviously, uh, consumers are also able to open you know, new mobile money or uh, you know, uh, mobile money accounts at these vendor points. Well, um, what does it entail to become a vendor or an agent? There's free entry and exit in this market. Uh, and you need to fulfill some initial capital requirements within the range of about $600 to $700. And then, of course, once you do that, you receive a business training and then you're set up as, as a vendor. Notice one thing, whilst vendors are trained about this market, there's really no formal training or information for consumers once they engage in this market, which will become extremely useful in thinking about the setting that we are looking at. Uh, as far as profits are concerned, the vendors earn commissions as profits based on, on, on the sales or the revenues that they make. Um, one nice thing about mobile money, uh, and speaking now about real stylized features about it, is that the, the tariffs or charges on transactions ex ante are set by providers. So if you to send like an X amount, typically this human ATM fee, does, it's really designated ex ante or is set by the provider. Well, what does this buy mean? It allows me to cleanly think about misconduct, basically as market actions at these vendor points that are overcharged, which will entail both you know, account services and this cash in and cash out transaction. What I'm showing you here on the screen on, the, on my right, essentially, is basically what happens at you know, vendor banking point. But one notable thing, perhaps, is to look at the, the picture on, on the bottom right corner called the mobile club. Uh, so basically, as you can see, this is a center that offers mobile money services and even other non-mobile money services, like lottery and you know, savings programs that you know, consumers are able to undertake at this vendor point. And by the way, this is about almost 70% of vendors in this market that engage in such kind of bundling of mobile money with other non-mobile money services. 
So um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, mobile money is really ideal for a lot of reasons. I'm not able, just for the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to go into the details, but let me highlight the three fundamental, you know, motivating facts, which is based on our baseline field trial. The fact is that I put on the three highs. The first high is that there's a high level of imperfect information. By the way, um, in a series of knowledge tests that we conducted at baseline about the true you know, transactional types or charges on these transactions, consumers typically about 42% correct, while vendors about 80% correct, which really makes sense given the, the market setting. Well, it also turns out misconduct is really high. And I'm gonna speak of misconduct from two angles. Objective misconduct is about 22%. This really suggests that about one in four transactions objectively are overcharged on this market. But guess what? When you ask consumers what this level of misconduct is, Consumers misperceive this level of misconduct reporting about, you know, a rate of about 60%. Okay, the third high is going to be about, you know, of course, which is not surprising given, you know, this, you know, misbeliefs about misconduct. Certainly, there's a high level of distrust in this market. And 62% of consumers reporting that, you know, they, they hold some level of distrust in transacting at this vendor banking point. The key point I want to highlight here are two things. One is that information matters in this market, which is going to be the focus of this experiment. Obviously, the market structure matters, but this is really not the goal of this paper. The second fact is that there's some room or some potential to build trust or reputation in this environment. So uh, the setting, as I mentioned, is Eastern Ghana. It's going to cut across nine different um, administrative districts, uh, with spanning about 130 different localities. Essentially, these are low-income environments. Um, as far as the sample construction is concerned, it entails a lot of groundwork. I'll spare you that, the details in the interest of time. But essentially, we, we re started by reconstructing this unique census of the market for mobile money across all these 130 uh, low-income environments in Eastern Ghana, which entails a door-to-door -door visit of each you know, locality, listing every single vendor at each corner, and listing around each vendor the potential households that are five houses radius around each given vendor, or we're going to call a local market. Um, so in total, we have about 2,000 customers or households listed with about 333 vendors uh, in, in the sample. Well, as far as the key main experiment is concerned, we're going to do a lot of restrictions just to test for spillover effects, along with power or statistical power. So we're going to end up you know, dealing with 130 vendors and about 990 customers in this market. So one thing I want to highlight is that the large number of markets or here localities here basically allows us to really conduct randomization at the market level or what I call local market level. Now, let me tell you a little bit, give you a snapshot of the interventions and how the programs were deployed. So essentially, um, there is a two-step process. So in the first step, all local markets or, you know, basically selected representative vendors who were selected here, receive a physical visit, right, from our research team. Subjects were shown basically about all the, basically the roster of all vendors within this village or what I call a local market. And then we provide our contact information about our research team where they can really seek for you know, assistance if, if they need. And in fact, this really touches on issues about you know, experimental demand effects. Surprisingly, a lot of people ended up calling us, you know, just being thankful for the services that we have provided, really speaking to the fact that these are really likely things that are not at play here. But just to move on in the second step, the markets that were assigned to treatment programs received either of the three programs. The first one is the, the price transparency program. The monitoring is the second one, of course, the joint program. And the key goal here that I want to highlight is that the idea is to minimize this information frictions between consumers and vendors whilst turning on you know, um, channels like social you know, uh, sanctions and, and direct punishment, which we can get through these two, two information programs. So this is basically a screenshot, just a text. I'm gonna read it out. Hopefully um, folks can see if you're not. So I'm starting from the first, from basically the left panel, and then I'll move to the right panel. And this is basically how we deployed our interventions. We will first visit the household or the selected customers, and then we provide them information like, look, uh, in, the, in the price transparency program, uh, we want to remind you, once as you go to visit a vendor banking point to conduct mobile money transactions, ask for the official tariff sheets. For example, if you want to open an account, conduct over the counter transaction, or even sending money through the vendor point, simply ask. It helps a lot. Uh, look, I uh, then went ahead and gave a couple of, you know, really stylized uh, charges that are really common within this market. For example, we took selected price based transactional sizes that are really common in this market and provided them what the true charges are on this market. For example, it is free to put money on your mobile money account, what folks might call wallet. Right after seeding the information with customers, we then move to the nearby vendor who is selected, right, for our experiment. And then we kind of basically provided the same information that consumers have been trained about what the true prices are. This is the information that we provided. And in both cases, we give both the consumers and the vendors 
really basically a summary of all the visit and consumers in fact both consum consumers and vendors were allowed to what uh, reinterpret our results just to make sure that we're on the same page for the monitoring program it's pretty simple we provided information about really um, how to call you know what the toll free number is surprisingly the majority were not really aware of this you know fraud you know toll free number that you could call for free and basically report and our message is that look the provider really helps a lot you can always call it's free to call and they always help and then we also see the same information with the vendors. So to just conclude, this is kind of the design, making it two-sided, even that consumers first receive, then we transfer the same information to that of the vendors. And obviously we conclude by asking them to basically rate the usefulness of the programs. So I cannot make progress in this paper without talking about how we measure this conduct. Certainly this is one of the key you know, strengths of this paper. We put this, you know, this paper took the measurement of misconduct seriously. Uh, in fact, we, did, we proposed, we basically designed this, uh, what I call a computer adaptive audit study process that allows us to really measure, you know, misconduct, you know, clearly and also ensure a lot of quality control. I'll spare you the details because of the time, but what I'm, I can promise you here on this slide is basically walking you through what we find as far as the baseline distribution of misconduct is concerned. I mentioned it about one in four transactions are overcharged in this market. This is where it's coming from. What I'm showing here is basically a figure that categorizes the different transactions within this space uh, that we studied in the market. And so we have kind of box transactions into what I call falsification transactions. In fact, these are transactions that you think should not be overcharged. And certainly you end up seeing less level of that relative to those that you think that are overcharged, really speaking to this whole fact that we are measuring things properly. Now, if you want to take these results from the extensive margin to the intensive margin, this translates about 82% about increase in the official tariffs. Well, as you know, there are papers that really shows that the beautiful thing about mobile money is about what? The low transaction cost. Certainly, this is not the case here. Okay, so let me jump on the results just uh, in the interest of time. So, uh, we'll start with the first stage results. So, the key first question is indeed, our program's anti misconduct? And the, the answer is yes. It's not only anti misconduct, but it's actually, it also shows large spillover effects on even vendors in villages that were treated, but you know, sorry, some vendors were treated in villages, but others were not. Even this really has some gigantic external effects on all of them within the village. Um, so just to put some numbers on this, what I'm showing you here is basically the reduction in misconduct, both on the in extensive margin and on intensive margin from the left to the right panel. So again, so you have a zero one indicator for whether a transaction is overcharged versus not, and the amount of overcharge as a response, uh, as a result of this misconduct. And clearly, if you were to take these numbers, uh, even looking at just a pooled treatment effect, basically pulling all the different treatment, the treatments together, you estimate about 21 to 23 percentage points reduction. This translates into about almost 7 to 2 percent reduction in misconduct. As I mentioned, the spillover effects actually for vendors that were in treated localities was about almost 15 percent, close to about 60 percent reduction meaningfully. And of course, we found also quite a bit of heterogeneity. So these results were much stronger in places where there were a lot of vendors. Think of it as really where the markets were more competitive. So the market structure seems to play a role. And it was also larger for female vendors. And I can speak to this if there's more time. Now, let me tell you the real effects. What does this matter? Well, it turns out they do. Consumers were better off and vendors, sorry, cost, the businesses were also generally better off. So just showing the pool effect here, the, basically, the, the, the log of transactions, the weekly transaction on the consumer side really increased by almost 40%. Coming down, we see about, about close to 6 to 8%, 8 percentage point increase in the likelihood that consumers are going to, you know, leave money to stay on their mobile money accounts for the purposes of saving, which translates to about 13% increase. But guess what? They were better able to mitigate unexpected shocks by about, about almost 7%, better able to mitigate shocks that were unexpected relative to their counterparts who were not treated. Now, let me jump on just to show you briefly the snapshot of what the firm level results are. Basically, there was huge really increase in, in sales as you'd expect. Indeed, if we are measuring things right for consumers, then why do we expect an increase in business sales, which is obviously what we find here. Close to about almost, almost a 40, a 39 to almost 40% increase in what, in sales if you just pull all the treatment together. Obviously, there's variation across treatments, but we don't find really a lot of evidence distinguishing them statistically. Uh, in the paper, we do a lot of really interesting stuff. Not only did mobile money sales went up, but in fact, sales that were non-mobile money at this vendor point also went up. So as you can see, vendors were not only better off, sorry, business were not only better off for mobile money services, but also for, for non-mobile money stuff, what I call bundle stores. Total revenue went up. And one key thing here, and I, this is a comment I received from uh, somewhere that really we need to think about the profits, right? Given that these vendors are commission motivated. If you allow for the reduction in, in, in transactions, so basically the charges, 
which you know would have went cheated by you know vendors and allow for the fact that sales went up you really find really essentially no effect on commissions for for vendors so for vendors in this case let's spread out but in fact if you allow vendors to actually have basically we allow for these bundle stores actually you can make the case that um, vendors were certainly better off now just to tell you i'm not going to spend any time on, on the mechanism but the story the underlying you know hypothesis here is that have two we, minutes francis excellent i think that's fine is to basically highlight the fact that the underlying hypothesis which we provide evidence for in this is that of a reputational mechanism that vendors expect that if they are more likely to be perceived by potential customers as irresponsible then they might end up you know being dishonest or commit uh they might, you know they, they you know in committing misconduct then they are less likely to do so well, we're going to appeal to, you know, Amit's, you know, you know, previous work on thinking about really how to think of seller reputation. He had a simple way here to think of really the consumer's perceptions about the tendency that the vendor will commit misconduct. We developed a very nice model in the paper thinking about really how the different treatments really could yield this reputational effect. I'm going to spare the details here and show you that to operationalize this empirically, we provide two pieces of evidence that are, so, so, you know, very uh, consistent with this interpretation. First is that consumers, you know, perception about a fraction of transactions that are worth uh, fraudulent, or if you want, uh, not fraudulent, in this case, honest transactions really increase by almost 30%, which is really in the right direction of our treatment. The second fact is not only is their, belief, their beliefs about what um, really honest transactions went up, but actually their beliefs became more better correlated with what objective level of misconduct is. So our interpretation here is that our programs really basically attenuated, right, all these misbeliefs about misconduct for consumers and raises the concerns for reputation, which is measured based on the likelihood of committing misconduct. I'll conclude, uh, this is my last slide. So I'm gonna show, basically the point here is that uh, misconduct matters with broad impacts on both sides of the market. And the second point is that reputation also does matter for misconduct. And to do this, our program basically attenuated the misbeliefs about misconduct whilst raising concerns for reputation for, for the vendors. My last point here, perhaps, and it's, I think, you know, kind of a, a big uh, point point is that basically trust or reputation, of course, is really crucial. Is that like the oxygen for, for commerce or, you know, think of payment markets that are scaling rapidly in developing countries. But this might be difficult to, to kind of get at due to imperfect information, which might exacerbate the standard. So I'll stop here and take if there are any questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And uh, thank you for keeping time. Uh, we have maybe a minute for questions if anyone wants to jump in um, from the panelists. And if any of those in the attendees want to throw a question in the Q&A, I think we might have time to answer that live. I had a quick question. Um, I was wondering, is this, uh, Francis, in this context, is it possible for the consumers to um coordinate punishments so if consumers are speaking and sort of i'm thinking more like multilateral interactions kind of causing punishments without um uh the vendor's uh involvement is there a way that you you could see that in this setting so i'm thinking of the maghrib traders as well you know they talk to each other information flows amongst them and then they punish the, the vendors no, I think this is great and this is something I thought about. At some point, I had to restrict the space of treatments I want to have. Obviously, it would be nice to have a treatment that shuts down the vendor information part, right? And then just, but obviously, you move into a large space of, so the goal was to have a sharply focused study, which gets at this. But certainly, I can speak to some evidence in the paper really speaks to, you know, whether this is really a communication story, as you have in mind, or perhaps this is like seeing, you know, customers shopping around or vendors maybe talking to themselves, right? Uh, I think the evidence is more consistent with really, you know, consumers also talking. But the point is that we can't really separate or disentangle really this coordinate, coordinated punishment mechanism from just, you know, the fact that people might just individually be doing that. But that's certainly a, a very great point, which we, we kind of get at in the paper. Great. Thank you. Uh, so let's take a five minute break um, and we'll come back at uh, half past. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, third. Yeah, yeah. Half past the hour. So yeah, five minutes. Thank you very much.
Robin, what's your prediction for the game today? Sorry, I said, yeah, I think um, the, the, if they, I think it depends whether they come out wanting to win it, you know, like hard, and I yeah. think they will, but if they don't, if they go the normal English way of holding back, then I think it's a, <laughs> it's a kind of, it's, it's, it's really, they've shown both sides in the tournament, you know, so I think that's really what, I think the, 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 it feels like the country wants them to come out and play that more attacking football, so I think if they do that, they will win, but it's, you know, it can always, with England, it can always fall apart very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. Well, yeah, Dan Denmark yeah. has been, uh, I think, a real Cinderella story. It's been actually yeah. really great to watch them progress through. So. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're playing really Which well. All, yeah, yeah, really, really well. Yeah. I'm I'm originally Scottish, so I'm a bit conflicted on <laughs> the whole thing. But Scotland did reasonably well against England, so at least that made that group of fans happy. I'm sorry, I have to jump into this conversation because it's my, it's my first time really watching the Euro Cup, and I am I am just so amazed at the British team's passion. Yeah. It's, it's a very different way of playing than than the kind of. So yeah, we're in a small uh, town in Oxfordshire, like a village, and are going to watch it in a village pub here. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh... but. Yeah, although I must say that the whole the whole it's coming home thing is a little obnoxious. No, it's too much. It's too oh, it's much. Like... But, but it's too much. It's too <laughs> oh much. But, but the thing that got me excited is so my, my husband's German, so we watched German England and it was painful, like deeply painful. But it was interesting how like their stereotypes kind of were upended of yeah. what you'd expect from Germany versus England. So it made it made Brexit worthwhile. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so bad. Like that's why this this is having such an effect on the country, you know. I think this is like a big symbolic thing. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, this. I mean, this is a big. I mean, if you like football, then there's also Argentina, Brazil coming up too, right? And the Copa yeah. America. So it's just like yeah, lots yeah, yeah, of like yeah, yeah. massive games coming up. So it's it's, uh, yeah. it's very that exciting. Will be that will be amazing. That will be a very good game. Yeah, I'm, I'm really oh looking forward to that one. Yeah. You saw Italy, Spain last night, Isaac. I bet. Yeah, I um, that one uh, that was that was a good yeah. It was you know it was a little tentative at first, and then they sort of opened up a little bit, and that, yeah, it was it was it was fun to watch. Uh, the penalties also, the penalties are, you know it's always a kind of kind of a coin flip. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Oriana Oriana was at the game at Wembley. Oh, that's right. It was at Wembley. Yeah. With the whole with bright, with the whole fight. bright blue hair. <laughs> yeah. With bright and so blue we hair. were. So we were talking today and it was she says like being there is like 300 times better than watching it on television <laughs> which i can totally understand yeah Looks. Uh, right. Are you ready? To... Yeah. Great. I think uh, there's a there's a people don't want to miss this, the start of the game, so we have to uh, try and keep time. So, uh, me to take. Oh yeah, me. Oh yeah. yeah. Let me pass yeah, the mic good. back to Amit. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks, Isaac. Uh, great. Well, welcome to the second half, I guess, uh, of this <laughs> great conference. So, we have uh, Noam presenting next on uh, schools out. Um, Noam, could you please uh, start sharing your screen? Sure, yeah, and I don't, I don't want to be in the way of um, right. conference and a game. That's always a precarious position. So, um, it's all on you. <laughs> <laughs> let me get on with it. Um, yeah, no injury time here, please. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, perfect. Can you see this? Yes. Could Great. you make it full screen? Um, yeah, I should have made it full screen. Is it is no. it visible? No. Full screen yet. 
Okay, I tested it before. Um, okay, maybe it's not. So maybe I'll just keep it like this because it's yeah, not. It, this works. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, it's it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for, for inviting us to join the conference. Uh, today, I'll be presenting Schools Out, Experimental Evidence on Limiting Learning Loss Using Low Tech in a Pandemic. Uh, this is joint with Peter Bergman at Columbia uh, and Moitepi Macheng, who's the co-founder of Young Love, which is one of the largest NGOs in Botswana uh, that scales RCT-backed health and education programs and is also the chairperson of the National Youth Council. Uh, so just to dive in, as we know, COVID has been not just a historic health crisis, but also a historic education crisis. Uh, this is a map from uh, UNESCO showing school closures all over the world, whether it was countrywide or localized, this is at a given point in time, and you can see it happened at most countries, over 1 billion children out of school. Uh, and so this was a real shock. How do you provide education when school is closed? So we had to resort to distance education all over the world. And one thing that we explored was using low tech, uh, as a partial substitute to school. And what we referred to low tech was feature phones, feature mobile phones. These were high access and low cost. So you can see that very strikingly in this figure here uh, from the Center for Global Development. You can see in the teal, for example, in upper middle income countries on the far right, about 60% of households have access to the internet. So still low even in upper middle income countries and then very low in low income countries below 20%. So this was not a medium to reach most people and certainly not the most uh, it marginalized and in need. In contrast, uh, the ownership of mobile phones is extremely high, about 90% in upper middle income countries. You can see that in the red on the far right. And it's still very high in low income countries. So uh, almost 80%. So this was a way to actually reach people and potentially those who really needed the, the educational support. So we launched a rapid trial in Botswana with 4,550 households uh, in distance learning through mobile phones. This is a density map and it actually covers most of the regions in the country. In the middle there is a desert uh, and it's about nine out of 10 regions of the country. So really at a large scale and a national scale. What was the intervention? On the left hand side, you can see a treatment arm that is a very simple SMS message. Uh, so this very simple basic foundational numeracy content, your uh, households were getting this uh, about once a week. Uh, welcome to week two. Here are some problems you can try with your children. You can see these are very simple problems. This is a place value problem. These are children in grades three through five. Uh, you can see 320 in words, 320 in numbers. Uh, so that's kind of an example. Then the next one is a fill in the blank, 325, and then fill in the blank. It gets a bit harder later. You can see there's a word problem at the end. Kamoholo has 257 pula. How many hundreds, how many tens, how many units? So very simple material uh, coming through the text actually took a bit of work to make it very compact. So it wasn't you know 15 SMS messages, which is overwhelming. This is coming through once a week. And on the right-hand side is a second treatment arm, which adds in uh, a phone call. So this is a 20-minute phone call uh, once a week, interacting directly with the child and, and the parent and the household to walk through these activities, give a few more activities. So it's a bit more intensive. And then cross-randomized in here was targeted instruction. So we actually collected data during the trial on students' learning levels. And then students who knew addition, for example, would get subtraction. Students who didn't know addition would get addition. So it was more targeted to their level. So this is the experimental design, about 7,550 numbers uh, we started with. Of those, about 6,400 were working. And of those, when we called to enroll them in the trial, about 4,550 consented. So that's about a 70% consent rate from uh, the working numbers, which is pretty high. Uh, and interestingly, actually, even these enrolled numbers, we, we compare it to national distributions of learning and income and ruralness, and it's actually quite representative, so nationally representative. Uh, and seems pretty pretty similar to the average distribution. Three treatment arms that control the SMS and the phone in SMS. And then at midline, we actually cross, we, we um, randomized who we called so we could do it quickly and, and uh, right away. And, and then we actually collected this data and then we targeted the messages there. And then you can see that second wave of data collection a few months later uh, to also see the effects of that. So a bit of context, this can't happen out of a vacuum actually. We, we, had to have a presence and we're doing something before because it happened very quickly. So before the pandemic, we were working in about 20% of primary schools in the country. Uh, we were scaling up uh, the more traditional model of teaching at the right level with a coalition of partners, Young Love, Ministry of Education, UNICEF, USAID, Pratham, J. Powell, and Brookings. 
Uh, and we collected phone numbers right as schools closed. We actually had three days from the announcement of school closure uh, until uh, they were closed. Uh, and amazingly, um, as you can imagine, uh, schools had lots of things that they were prioritizing. So the fact that they even shared numbers and that students and households shared numbers was really amazing because they were packing up, they were going home, uh, but we got thousands and thousands of numbers all across the country. So the demand for this was really surprisingly very, very high, but people were very nervous. What are they gonna do? How are their children gonna get an education? Uh, we got uh, and did this intervention with uh, children and the parents and caregivers at the household. We used the word caregiver because sometimes it was a grandparent or a cousin. Uh, so whoever was the person at the household taking care. Interestingly, about 80% of the phone numbers we got were folks who actually had no prior contact with us. So the word spread so far and wide, it wasn't actually even those that were enrolled in the interventions ahead of time. So that's just to give you a sense of, of how this all happens. And the final thing I would say is uh, we were really torn because on the one hand, it was a humanitarian crisis. We actually just wanted to get services to everyone. On the other hand, there was so much uncertainty around what could work. Uh, we actually felt we needed evidence more than ever or else we had kind of throwing the kitchen sink at how to do distance education uh, and we have very limited budget so so there was this real tension do you do a trial do you not do a trial and we settled on doing a very rapid trial so we collected data every four to five weeks so that we could get a real-time sense of was this working and if it was we would scale it up to more people uh, and the government was interested in these questions from the beginning they actually said they were always interested in asking teachers to call students as an intervention through the phone for extra remedial support during summer holidays during other shocks that happen uh, but they just weren't sure if it would be effective so this was of high interest to the government uh, potentially activating this strategy so in terms of some, some contributions it was some of the first rct evidence on curbing learning loss during covid uh, it's also, this really opened our eyes, of course, this uh, school closure shock is historic in nature, but we realized it actually happens in many settings. So it happens during teacher strikes, summer breaks, earthquakes, weather shocks, rainy seasons. We actually had not really thought about how do you support education when school is disrupted, and we realized actually it does happen in, in a, a number of settings, and so we need strategies for this, this kind of setting. Uh, particularly important for low-income households which don't have as many books at home, don't have internet access. Uh, and also looking at technology not just as a complement to ongoing schooling, but actually how can it potentially partially substitute? Uh, what role can it play and can it be effective as a, as a partial substitute? Uh, as mentioned, relating to the literature on teaching at the right level, that's usually an in-person uh, model, either through a classroom-based approach or adaptive software. This is another potentially cheap and scalable approach to think about doing it through the feature phone. And there's a lot of literature on tutoring being effective in high income settings. This could be a scalable way to do it in a low income, middle income setting. So in terms of the data, uh, we have data on engagement, parent perceptions, and also their return to work and how that related to their educational instruction engagement. Uh, and we also measured learning. Uh, we measured learning remotely, so we introduced a few innovations also to validate this assessment. It's also part of the contribution we feel. We use the author assessment, which uh, has been used a lot in the literature and is used routinely in 14 countries. And we added a few other questions as well, like place value and fractions. Uh, here you can see a, a gist of it, so two digit addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, very simple foundational numeracy concepts. Uh, and here's the bottom line on the results. So what you can see on the SMS only on the far left, uh, this is in the red, the average level. So that's the addition to division spectrum. And this is in terms of standard deviation. You can see small positive effects. This is actually not significant. I can show that in the tables later. Uh, and it doesn't translate hugely to place value and fraction. So not huge effects on the SMS on its own. With the phone and SMS, you are seeing quite large and very significant effects. So 0.12 standard deviation gain on average level. And interestingly, this translates all the way to fractions, which is very interesting because we actually didn't teach fractions. And so there was some broader concept of learning and it doesn't look like it was just familiarity uh, with the material. It was an actual learning and cognitive skill. If you look at whether it was targeted or not, uh, you can see what, when it's targeted at uh, 0.7 standard deviation there, uh, and that is significant. And then uh, it doesn't translate to place value in fractions. Uh, when it is targeted, you can see it's actually similar on the average level. So there's actually not a huge difference there on the core material, but it actually helps you go above and beyond to the place value and the fraction. So that's really interesting uh, because it, it sort of, that's kind of the point of targeting in a way is it's actually helping you adapt and go above and beyond. 
Uh, in terms of the learning measurement, uh, we wanted to see if this assessment was robust, and so we introduced a bunch of innovations to measure that. This is just one of them. So we randomized which problems students got uh, of the same proficiency. So this is one example. We did this for all the proficiencies. Uh, and this is, for example, a two-digit addition problem. So you can see each column there is a different set of numerals and numbers. And we wanted to see that it's picking up some latent ability. This is in the control group. And indeed, we see across the board, no matter which problem they get, about 15% of kids who can do addition. So that's one uh, validity test that borrows on the psychometric literature where they do assessment. Uh, there's a series of others, uh, happy to describe those. In terms of engagement and demand, uh, we see very high engagement. So uh, we see that folks in the SMS and phone, over 90% of those are engaging and, and interacting with the intervention. In terms of demand, I'll, I'll draw actually your attention to the control mean here of those who had no demand. So this is a random subset at the midline, uh, and you can see it's very small. So actually 99% of households wanted to receive these services. And the question was asked, even if schools were to reopen, it's actually really extraordinary. I actually rarely have ever seen the number 99% in real life. So in addition to the learning results, just the fact that people wanted this to that degree was pretty extraordinary. Uh, that's the control mean, that's not a treatment effect. If you look at the treatment effects, this is on the type of demand, there isn't going to be a treatment effect on any demand because it's just so high, so you can't see anything there. Uh, but in terms of the type, do they want the phone, do they want the SMS, and so forth, what you can see here that's interesting is it's not a grass is always greener story. So it's not that the SMS people were sort of jealous and wanted the phone. Actually, if they got the SMS, they liked it and they wanted it more. So you can see that in column three there. And the people who got the phone, they liked it, they wanted it more, even bigger treatment effects. Essentially, it was even more effective. Uh, and so it looks like they noticed what they got, they liked what they got, they wanted more of what they got. In terms of the parents... Norm, no, just yeah. a quick clarification from Jenny. Um, yeah. Do you have data on learning losses in the control group over time? So we don't actually. We do wish we had measured that. We didn't have time to do a baseline because we launched this so quickly. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have that, but we, we do wish we had had that. Thanks. Thank, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and uh, in terms of parental uh, investments and beliefs, uh, what you can see here, there's three measures here. One is whether the parents can identify the child's level. So there's a large literature on the fact that it's very hard to actually know what children do and don't know. And teachers and parents often don't know this. Learning is very invisible. It's very visible if a child is sitting in school, but what they know, maybe many of us acutely feel this now, it's very hard to know what they actually know and, and don't know. Uh, and you can see in the treatments that were most effective, so the phone and SMS, there's a higher identification of the child's level. So they're engaged, they're kind of seeing what their child knows and doesn't know. They're also feeling much more confident about supporting education in the household. Uh, you can see the support kind of confidence translates a bit more, the identification less, that's in the treatment group where there were the biggest effects. In terms of crowd out, this could be a potential concern. So if we're asking parents and caregivers to engage in education, uh, are we you know, unintentionally potentially crowding out the labor market and going back to work when, when the lockdown eases? So we wanted to measure that. Uh, what we see is that doesn't seem to be the case. So you can see in column two here, I'm just giving you one example, highlighting here, it actually reduces those who don't return to work so and slightly increases those who are returning to work. Uh, and that's promising. I mean, it's not a labor market intervention, but we're not so worried about the crowd out. We wanted to make sure that wasn't happening. One rationale for this that we've heard is parents actually felt very confident and comfortable with where their child progressed to. So they actually felt like when the lockdown eased, they could get back to work. They weren't so worried about their child's education. Um, so that, that could be one explanation. In terms of some policy implications, it is moderately effective. I would say it's not insanely effective, but moderately effective. Where it really stands out is actually its cost effectiveness because it's so cheap. Uh, everyone already has these phones, so you're not actually providing new hardware. And so when you look at the cost effectiveness for $100, it's about 0.89 standard deviation gain. That's on the highest end of the literature. So that's really where, where this approach stands out. Uh, it, another point on the policy is governments actually spend a ton of money on ICT and technology. This is a very consistent line item in many ministry budgets, but it often goes to the flashier kind of high tech things like tablets and computers. I was speaking to one ministry recently that spent 10% of their entire budget on tablets, 10% of their entire budget, including teacher salaries. That's supposed to show you the magnitude. Uh, and so those are often the investments. 
rather than either software instead of hardware or a pedagogy focused intervention like a teacher phone call to deliver instruction. So governments could consider spending these line items on those pedagogy and, and software in addition to hardware. Another interesting piece on the parent side, uh, parents are engaged in education systems, but often it's largely through information, report cards, PTAs, that kind of thing. But here we ask parents to actually engage in the instruction. Uh, and they were super effective, even in a very low literacy setting. Almost very few of the households had actually ever gone to university. They were very nervous actually to do this at first. They said, it's the teacher's job, it's not my business. But eventually they got really into it and they got very excited about it. So that's an interesting margin to explore. Uh, as I said, this has really opened our eyes to this broader issue of school disruption, which is actually quite common, even if not on the same scale, and how do we support education in those moments. Uh, and then a very important policy implication is because these results came out quite quickly and were very rigorous, uh, it's actually inspired action in over five countries. I'm, I'm going to close by just touching on this. Uh, and this is also a very live effort. So any and all feedback on this is very much appreciated because these trials are ongoing. So this is now being adapted and tested in over five countries under this broader agenda of how do we build resilient education systems and how do we think about scalable and robust education in emergencies. So there's actually a lot of aid agencies that spend a lot of time and money on this, like the IRC and USAID and FCDO, but there's very little evidence because these emergencies are humanitarian crises. So it's very hard to generate good evidence in these settings, but it's when we need more, more information, actually, not less. Uh, and uh, what's happened here, actually, is in about 15 months, we've launched six trials in six countries since the Botswana study, 25,000 households. So you can see here on the left-hand side from April to July of 2020, the Botswana trial, and since then, November 2020, and I'm going to show you through August 2021 in about a, a month, uh, it's going to be five new trials in Kenya, Nepal, India, Philippines, and Uganda with a series of partners, World Bank, government, uh, NGOs, IPA, Teach for All, uh, and others. Um, so a few questions we're looking at. One is the effect of the core phone call intervention across these very heterogeneous contexts to inform the generalizability of this approach. Uh, another is we're actually comparing NGO arms to government delivery to speak to some of these scale uh, questions. Another is the effect on the teachers as well as on the students and looking at whether this is changing their motivation, their instructional practice uh, to get at some system level spillover effects. And we're also incorporating a suite of validity assessments uh, and innovations on the remote assessment. So randomized problem comparing in person and phone, uh, back checks calling a week or two later, seeing if you get the same result and, and so forth. So uh, just the final, I'll close by giving a shout out to the remarkable coalition that has made this possible. It's truly a tremendous feat, both the funders, the implementers, and the research partners. Uh, and I think that's the end. So thank you. Looking forward to questions. Thanks, Tom. Um, Karen would like to ask some questions, so I'll just, uh, Karen, feel free to join in. Thanks, Amit. Uh, no, great paper, very interesting. Uh, my question is on the, on, related to your last point. Uh, so for, the, uh, for the first study in terms of the assessment, is it you have both have oral assessment and text message assessment, and did you look at how it interacts with the treatment variations to look at any kind of, rule out any mechanical effects of familiarity versus actual learning? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great point. The assessment was all done over the phone. We didn't do SMS responses for the assessment. So that was, there was a treatment on the SMS and a phone call, uh, but it's a great and important distinction that all the data was collected through a phone call, not through uh, automated SMS. And, and did you see whether you have a, a systematic, I guess you can't really do that. Anyway, like it's worth thinking just in terms of some of the validity tests of the different treatment variations and how the, your validity indicators uh, change uh, to try to separate our learning from assessment field. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I would say since the phone call, it's actually a phone call, so it's a, it's a very familiar mode of communication. I would worry about it more if it was a new mode, like entering something into a tablet people weren't used to, then I would think maybe the treatment made them very familiar with it, so somehow they were proficient. But actually, it's, it's a phone call, so it's, it's actually something they're very comfortable with. But, but it's a good point. We'll, we'll think about that more. Let me just jump in with, real quick with one question, which is, um, this is just more just a contextual one. How much content can you deliver like let's say you you know you can do this at scale and you have everything you need like you know if you're thinking about this as you know we've been out of school for some places for a year or so 
how much can you expect to deliver through this? Like, are we talking like six months worth of it? I mean, like in terms of like the actual curriculum, you know, what's what's two weeks, three weeks, three months? Like what what are these learning effects that you could possibly get out of this? That you think? Uh, yeah, no, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, so it was very, you saw it was very simple content, foundational, you know, this is grades three through five, we were doing place value, addition, subtraction, so it's a good point. I'm not sure you could teach calculus through the phone very effectively. Um, we haven't tried that, we're not planning to try that, but I think that is an important caveat. It's not like you can teach everything and anything forever through the phone. It might be important for these foundational basics uh, in these moments where those, those are big gaps. And, as we've seen in many presentations and other research, there's often a big gap on these foundations. So it's an important thing to bridge, but it's, I don't know that you could deliver uh, all content through it. Uh, and, and we are focusing on this in all the replication trials. We have a bit of a broader grade spectrum. So it's actually from grades one all the way through five. Uh, and so we can look at that, but, but it's a good point. It's not for all content. Great, uh, thank you, Noam and Karen and Isaac uh, for contributing at the end. Noam, there's a clarifying question on the chat, so maybe you want to address that in due course. Um, we shall move to the final part of the day. Um, we have 20 minutes, so Jenny, uh, you have the full 20 minutes, so the floor is yours. And I see Kelsey is uh, with us as well, so feel free to for the participants to join in and drop questions. We are 100 people still online, so super excited, Jenny, to have you. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you everyone for staying here until the very, very end. I very much appreciate it. I know we're in between your coffee break or your dinner break or a, a big upcoming match. So I will try and keep this short and sweet. Um, but that being said, I'm very enthusiastic about presenting this and I'm very enthusiastic about this topic. Um, this is something that I've been wanting to work on since I started working in Niger about 20 years ago. And this is joint with Kelsey Jack at UCSB and could not have been done without our partners, the Ministry of Environment and Sahel Consulting in Niger. I'll also stop at a few points if people have some questions or clarifying questions, if you just wanna jump on in. But overall, kind of the motivation for this research was basically to say that over the course of the past few decades, we've seen agricultural yields practically double in many parts of the world, uh, but they've remained relatively stagnant in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Obviously there's a number of reasons for that, but one of the major constraints is the quality and quantity of agricultural land. If we focus just on the Sahel, which is that band in between the Sahara and the coastal area of West Africa, it's estimated that about half of that land suffers from poor soil fertility. And the way in which a number of small scale farmers have really dealt with these constraints is via extensification. So they're using small quantities of labor and inputs as compared with the land under cultivation. Um, but that being said, with high population density and climate variability, this has led to shorter fallow periods and less availability of arable land. And so then what's required for sustained yield improvements in these parts of the world is really agricultural practices that do two things, uh, increase the level and duration of water in the soil and replenish soil nutrients. Now there's a number of ways that can be done, not necessarily all of them are appropriate for the semi-arid areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, but one technique that is appropriate is the rainwater harvesting techniques. So rainwater harvesting techniques, there's over 70 of them. And many of them are indigenous to Sub-Saharan Africa, but not necessarily all. And basically they're micro catchments. So they're small structures that you put in your land. Uh, they capture rainwater, they prevent soil runoff. They ensure that there's higher soil nutrients. I'm showing you three of the most common techniques used in Sahelian West Africa here. And basically kind of the main cost is labor for construction at the beginning. And then you see these benefits over time, primarily in the second and the third years. We're gonna be concentrating on one technique, which is the demi-lune, which means a half moon in French. And the reason we're gonna be concentrating on that is because it's the most appropriate rainwater harvesting technique for half of all degraded land in Sahelian West Africa, which is called a glacis. So just to give you a sense of what a glacis actually is, you see this picture here on the right. Uh, the glacis is not the green part, it's the brown and the tan part. And basically it's land that is no longer fertile. Even if you left it fallow, nothing would grow there anymore, not even kind of pasture land. And so you need some type of technique, again, to do these two things, which is increase the water uh, in the soil and replenish these soil nutrients. And so these, these demi-loons basically have different dimensions depending upon their usage. Um, agricultural ones are pretty large, about two to four meters in dimension. They're pretty deep, uh, 15 to 30 centimeters. And basically it's recommended by ministries and international organizations 
to construct between 250 and 300 of these on one hectare of land. But that kind of norm is pretty mechanical because if you just take a hectare and then you look at the dimensions, uh, basically you can see that it's gonna get you about 300. Sorry, was there a question? Okay. No, keep going, Jenny. The optimal period for constructing these um, is basically in the off season. So after the harvest and before the rainy season. So there's a five or a six month period um, that doesn't compete with agricultural labor, although it may compete with kind of seasonal migration and other types of um, off farm labor. And there's three things you can do with these demi loons. You can either not do anything and then kind of grassland grows there. You could plant trees in them or for agricultural ones, you can plant crops in and around them. Now, previous agro agronomic trials have said that basically you know, estimated that it's about $80 um, to construct all of these demi on one hectare. It's about 30 cents per demi -loon. And the idea here is that once you construct them, maintenance is very limited. Um, basically, they do their job over the course of the three years. And at the end, kind of the land in that demi and potentially right around it is going to be recuperated. And then you could potentially construct demi in between the old ones. So there's been decades of agronomic trials that really show that demi loons reduce soil erosion, reduce the risk of crop failure, um, and then with some complementary inputs, kind of can triple yields and increase profits. There's also been a significant amount of investment in demi loons uh, over the course of the past few decades by ministries, NGOs, and international organizations. But despite that kind of adoption remains low, in Niger, where we're studying, uh, basically it's estimated that fewer than 10% of farmers use these techniques on any part of their land. And then the question for really about that is why. Um, we did a previous pilot prior to this study, which suggests there were three types of constraints. Information constraints, either maybe you didn't know about it, but more likely you didn't necessarily have the technical knowledge to construct them. Secondly, liquidity constraints, given the fact that you have these upfront costs for labor for constructing them, maybe you don't necessarily have the cash on hand. And third, kind of given the time profile of costs and benefits, then kind of discount rates might be playing a role here. So what we do is that we try and kind of answer this question or this puzzle about, you know, why is the adoption of a technology that seems profitable, at least based upon some previous research, uh, why is it kind of remaining at this 10% level? And we do this in the context of a village level randomized control trial, where we design interventions um, to try and relax some of these adoption constraints. So we have one control and four treatments. Uh, all of the treatments have a training component in order to address this information constraint. But then there's also three financial incentives. Um, so we have an unconditional cash transfer early that comes in before you construct the dreaming loon to try to address the liquidity constraint. Then we have the conditional cash transfer, which occurs after you've constructed the demi loons. And then because UCTs and CCTs not only differ in the modality, but also the time that they're paid out, we have an unconditional cash transfer, which happens after you've actually constructed the demi loons. And we just did these interventions for the first year. Then we collected the data that year and then kind of for three additional years. Um, and overall, since I have a very short time period, I just wanted to kind of give you a preview of the results and then see if there might be some clarifying questions. But we find kind of three or four major things. First of all, all of the treatments, uh, including kind of the training alone, increase the adoption of demi loons along the extensive margin. About 95% of farmers in treated villages adopted at least one demi loon. So training was really successful in getting farmers to try out this technology. Secondly, kind of the intensity of their adoption was about 35 more demi loons, at least in the first year, as compared to the control. We initially saw a little bit of higher adoption um, amongst two of the kind of financial incentive treatments in the first year, but that really converged by the third year. We also saw modest increases in adoption over time, as well as spillovers on neighbors. And then third, we really saw these improvements in some of these downstream outcomes, including total agricultural production, um, re agricultural revenues, asset ownership, and improved soil quality. And then we kind of provide some insights as to why something like the training alone would be so effective and just kind of inducing adoption in some of these downstream outcomes. So I'm just gonna stop here and just see if there's any clarifying questions before maybe I, or other questions. So, so Jenny, can you can you just um, say something about like what would be the what would the experimental stations say about the optimal coverage of demi loons in a I mean are the farmers anywhere close to what the what would be optimal or are they still pretty far away from that? So by the end of the third year, um, depending upon kind of how we exactly measure degraded land, there are about 30 to 35 percent of kind of what the ministry suggests as norms, right? So they're doing about 40 to 50 demi loons per hectare of degraded land as compared to kind of these norms of 250 to 300. 
we try and talk about that a little bit at the end about kind of what, what might explain kind of this, this under adoption. And we have some hypotheses on that. Okay. So we're focusing on Niger, uh, which is kind of one of the poorest countries in the world and kind of suffers from extreme um, soil degradation. We're mainly focusing on Niger, which is in the east, which is simultaneously the breadbasket of the country, but also 50% of its land is severely degraded. Uh, we're working in 180 villages that all have this type of soil, which is the glassy. And we're working with 16 farmers per village, um, stratified by gender, which is about 2,800 households. And the original eligibility criteria was that you just had to have degraded land between uh, half a hectare and, and five hectares. And so the rollout of this intervention was basically that in 2018 in January, we did a listing survey. So we went in with these eligibility criteria. We kind of identified all eligible households, which was about 4,000. Then we stratified by gender and we chose about 2,800 of them to get our sample for this study. We did a baseline survey on a subset of those. And then in March of that year is when we did the training. So the training was done at the same time for all four of the different kind of uh, intervention groups. And some things to notice about the training that I think are important in terms of interpreting these results in as to how they're different from kind of previous trainings are, are these four things. First of all, it was a combination of theory and practice. You can see on the lower left-hand corner that the Ministry of Environment is explaining kind of the theory of how the demoline is done. And in the right-hand corner, you then went out to a field as a group of 16 and you practice building three demi loons in terms of dimensions, structure, kind of spacing. The second thing is that we provided a book in Hausa. Uh, illiteracy rates are quite high in Niger. So these also had pictures that just basically showed you step by step. And this is a combination of French and Hausa below, but they had a resource that they could actually use. The third is, is that we really emphasize that demi loons are things that could be used on your own plot of land, not just on common land, because this is commonly what kind of the government and many NGOs is promoted as something that could have been used on communal land uh, with the hopes that people would adopt it on their own land. And finally, we really emphasize that kind of farmers could use tools that were at their disposal. So shovel, pickaxes, rope, uh, they could count out the dimensions. They didn't need necessarily something that was provided by others. After the training, we announced the cash transfers uh, to all of the groups. And about a month later, kind of the first cash transfer group got it, uh, the UCT early was about $20, which was a quarter of the estimated value about what it would actually cost. And then about two months later, we went back in, we did a verification of these demi loons, and then we paid out the conditional cash transfer and the UCT late. Uh, we then went back in and did kind of demi loon verification for the next three years, and basically then did a midline survey and an endline survey. We're gonna be using most of these data with the exception of the most recent round of demi loon verification, but happy to answer some questions on that. So in terms of just to give you an idea of what the sample looks like, um, you know, households had about five members. They owned about four hectares of land and about half of that was degraded. And about 60% of that is classified as glassy. And the last thing that I want to kind of bring your attention to is that about a third of households in our sample cited having demi loon experience. But here I want to emphasize it wasn't necessarily experience on your own private plot of land. It was that you were potentially hired uh, by an NGO or by the government to work on communal land or to work on someone else's land. And there's a little bit of imbalance there, which we can kind of correct for as well in some of our ENCOVA specifications. So then we're just basically regressing a variety of outcomes on these individual treatments. And then we end up pulling these treatments uh, and correcting kind of our standard errors. Most of the regressions I'm gonna be showing you today are cross-sectional rather than pooled. So we're gonna look at kind of three, four sets of results, uh, the adoption results, the ag output results, um, inputs and then kind of some mechanisms and some remaining questions. So I already said previously what the extensive margin of adoption was in, in year one. Uh, and basically about 4% of control households tried a demi loon and overall 95% of treated households tried at least one demi loon. And you can see here there's not a statistically significant difference between the treatments. So training alone was kind of uh, useful in nudging kind of people to adopt or at least try or experiment. And then in terms of the intensive margin of adoption, I'm showing you these unconditional measures for all demi loons, not per hectare or conditional, uh, but we have those as well. And you can see here that the control group was basically trying one demi loon. Uh, in the training group, they were trying kind of 20 additional demi loons as compared to the control. And here is where you see kind of at least in the first year, the UCT early and the CCT groups we're constructing about 25 to 40% more demi loons as compared with the training alone. So there was like a little bit of a bump up. So overall, they were kind of adopting about 35 additional demi loons. Um, that's kind of total, not necessarily per hectare of degraded land. 
per hectare of degraded land was about 25. And there was some heterogeneity in these results. So one thing we might be interested in is to say, well, we see this bump in the CCT, maybe households were constructing more demi loons in the hopes of kind of getting paid more. And so an interesting question would be, well, what was the quality of those demi loons? So all, everything I'm showing you here is demi loons of high quality, but we compared the total number of demi loons with the number of demi loons of high quality, which we're calling a quality ratio. And that was similar across all four of these groups. It was about 88% and they weren't statistically significant. So it doesn't seem as if people were rushing to kind of construct more demi loons in the CCT group. The final thing I just want to note is how this changes over time. So, you know, for the extensive margin in the treatment group, they couldn't really go anywhere. They were already at about 95%. In the control group, that increased from about 4 to 17% in 2020. Uh, and then it's interesting to see that the kind of the number increases from about 1 to about 10 in the control group. And again, this is unconditional. But the key takeaway of this graph was just basically to say that over time, what we see is there's some additional adoption in these treatment groups but really it converges, right? So there's not statistically significant differences in the number of demi loons adopted by actually the third year. So those initial differences that we saw no longer persist. Uh, most of them are operational, right? So as I said before, there's not much maintenance that you have to do, but maybe you put them in the wrong place and they would have disappeared. Uh, we don't necessarily see that. And as I said previously, answering Robin's question, it was about 50 demi loons per hectare of degraded land by the final year, which is about 25% of the recommended norms. Are there questions on that before I move on for some of the? I, I had one question, um, yeah. Jenny. Uh, I, do you have any? This is super interesting, by the way. And I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts on um, the control group dynamics? Is there some social learning going on? There's, you know, that increase in the point estimate, but maybe they're not statistically different. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I mean, what we do see is spillovers on neighbors, actually kind of the neighboring plot and a spillover sample within our treatment villages. So there is some social learning and experimentation that is happening. Um, you know, it's possible that kind of members of the control group could have heard about these interventions. We haven't necessarily looked at this in terms of in the control group's distance to the treatment group to see whether or not that could potentially be explaining this additional adoption. But again, it goes from kind of four to 17%. And but it seems as if they have kind of potentially uh, heard about that, but we don't necessarily have the mechanisms for that. But we have seen spillovers within the villages themselves. So just in terms of some of the downstream outcomes, we're looking at total agricultural output, not just kind of what you did on your on your demi loon plot. So just to emphasize that and we have that in the midline. So a year later and then two years later. So the key takeaway in columns one and five is that it didn't change what you were planning or what you were selling. Um, what it did have an effect in on the short term was that it reduced the likelihood of crop failure by about 50% in the short term that didn't persist in the longer term. And what did persist is kind of its impact on the production of crops and also the value of those crops using a z-score so that we see it's about 0.13 and 0.414 standard deviations in the short term that gets stronger in the longer term. And this is mainly coming from three crops, millet, sorghum, and sesame, all of which are staple food and cash crops in Niger. Uh, and Did Jenny freeze or is it just me? Uh, no, she did. Uh, okay. Uh, Kelsey, are you in touch with Jenny by any chance? Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not. She's in a different country than me. We could have done um, a distribution, but maybe, maybe. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm actually on a pretty bad internet connection, but I'm happy to. I don't have her slides. If you want to, oh, I guess she's dropped off completely. Let's see. Let me try to see what's going on.
I can see if I can find their slides and uh, take over if you guys are game for that. Sure. Uh, we actually sure. have the slides. I, I might oh, ask you do. Okunda to share the screen if that's okay. That would be fabulous. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> oh, Jenny's <laughs> back. <laughs> for literally four hours, except for now. <laughs> Anyway, I don't, I don't want to hold people up because I, I know that they're waiting. Then you have like two minutes. So maybe if you want to wrap up or. Yeah. So basically kind of maybe three key takeaway points, which is that basically a lot of those agricultural outcomes that we saw are, are related to improvements in, in land quality, that people were more likely to kind of report having higher soil quality, more moisture and more vegetation, and were able to cultivate about 0.3 more hectares of land. Um, if we look at the cost side of things, the costs were mainly from labor and materials. They were spending about $15 and they were mainly reallocating their family labor. Um, so they were maybe a little bit less likely to migrate or engage in kind of um, off farm, uh, our farm labor. And they used more of that family labor to build these demi loons. And then the takeaway is, is that their costs were basically $30 and their benefits were about $40 per year. So it seems as if this was a profitable technology. Um, and then what we do in the paper is try and talk a little bit about kind of why we think training was so effective and really kind of we land on two things. The first one is the technical advice that it imparted. We, we show that basically it really moved the needle on allowing farmers to learn about how to construct demi loons and most importantly, kind of the, the things that were uh, the most important for making demi loons effective. And secondly, it allowed for social learning. So we saw kind of an increase in the likelihood of adoption of neighbors but also kind of our spillover sample. And then in terms of why we don't see higher levels of adoption, getting back to Robin's question, uh, part of that is related to the way in which kind of uh, degraded soils are glassier measured, and then simultaneously some behavioral barriers that we've tried to address with a nudging experiment that we basically did in January. So I will end it there. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, I had a quick question, which is a bit outside the context um, on the on the role of norms. So, you know, in, in these kinds of situations, usually in many other settings, we see cooperatives develop and kind of step in. I was wondering what's preventing uh, those sort of corporate cooperative norms uh, stepping in here. Um, if you had any thoughts about people coming together and kind of like shared labor, and then you know you work. So we did see that in certain villages. It wasn't kind of systematic across all villages, right? It, it really seemed to have depended. And so, but there were certain villages, there was a group of eight or nine people, they came together and then they did it on kind of my plot and then I moved to yours. But it seems as if most of them were using their own family labor and then hiring kind of non-family labor, about seven person days. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a barrier. I mean, I guess it's kind of depends on kind of what are, what are the existing norms within those villages for doing agricultural labor. Great. Um, I think we can we can call the session a close. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll pass over to Robin. Maybe you want to say any last words, but thank you everyone for staying till the end and uh, look forward to day two tomorrow. Thanks. No, no, no. Just thank you everyone and um, uh, enjoy the football. <laughs> see you. See you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks.